Hello, and welcome to the Bitcoin Dot Review podcast. This is an ad free pod. Thank you so much for streaming those ads. If you're a new listener, I'm NVK and I run CoinKite, where we've been helping people secure their Bitcoins for over a decade. We make products like the Code Card, the Block Clock, and we have a bunch of other projects. You can find more information on coinkite.com. Today, we're going to be talking about Bitcoin core development and trying to demystify it, maybe sort of like shed some light so, so some of the FUD goes away and new FUD comes in, maybe. Who knows? I have this awesome panel with me. I have uh, James O'Byrne. Hi, James. Hi. Good to be here. Thanks for coming. Uh, Shores. Hello. Thanks for coming back. And Mike. Good to see you again. Do you guys want to tell the audience what you guys do related to Core? Sure. So, yeah, my name is James, and uh, I've done work on Bitcoin Core since 2015 when um, I made a patch that's actually kind of coming back into relevance. It uh, obfuscated the, the chain state contents, um, anything that's loaded into memory, because we were uh, having this problem where Norton antivirus software on Windows platforms would actually wipe out the chain data because someone had embedded viral signatures in op returns, uh, which is pretty funny. Now we're talking about do that, doing that for, for blocks, of course, with the rise of uh, inscriptions. But I, so I, um, since 2018, I've worked full time on Bitcoin Core and, uh, and related projects. Cool. Uh, Shores. Yeah, I, um, I've been working on Bitcoin Core since 2017, doing mostly review stuff, hanging around in the wallet, but I also like to test completely random stuff and, and review it. So I've, I've looked at some of James' work and, and other people. Cool. And Mike? I've never contributed to Bitcoin Core, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm the outsider on, the, on this panel, but I do have some, I think, interesting insights into... Um, the, the funding world around Bitcoin Core, as well as some of the supporting efforts that isn't necessarily the zeros and ones that James and Shores are doing, but uh, support some of those efforts in, in terms of uh, funding, education and news. So I actually got my sort of break into the Bitcoin world with uh, working at Blockstream and then actually met James through Bitcoin Optech, one of the initiatives that he helped start. And so I help contribute at Optech and also uh, executive director at Brink, where we actually fund Bitcoin open source developers. So that's sort of my background and perspective. And uh, I guess uh, you're being very short there on Optech, uh, which is uh, an absolutely fantastic resource that I believe started to, to try to educate industry on what's going on with Bitcoin core development, right? Because, you know, Realistically speaking, I mean, industry has very few sort of devs that, that often can understand or contribute to Bitcoin Core. You know, people are busy building stuff that ships to customers. And, uh, and there was always this like huge gap between like what's going on in Bitcoin, which can seem a little messy and sort of like very opaque. And, uh, and how can we sort of like let people know that like, you know, these are the things that people are working on. Yeah, I think James could probably provide a, a bit more of the of the history, but I think it was a suggestion by Adam Back um, that the communication lines should be opened between developers and and Bitcoin businesses, and I think Optech has done a pretty good job about digesting developments in the technical Bitcoin dev space and surfacing those to a less technical or, or less involved audience, including Bitcoin businesses. Um, and I think we've done a good job of that and, and maybe less of a good job. And maybe there's more potential about getting more feedback from Bitcoin businesses or Bitcoin users about um, how folks are using the software um, and, and feedback on that. So I think, I think it's an interesting sort of like thread that the reason why I started pull on, pulling on from there is because Traditionally, Bitcoin core development was sort of opaque because it's like anarchic, right? People work on what they want to work. They may not even be on GitHub per se. And uh, there is sort of like nobody decides on what gets worked on. So, so there's a, like a lot of initiatives going on at the same time and, and they may not have like people's priorities in mind. 
it's whatever people want to work on, right? It's very hard to keep track of that stuff. It's very hard to to understand half the time what people are working on because of the technical complexity. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I imagine the motivation behind Optech was around the block wars where there was a lot of opacity, not due to anybody's intent, but it's just that like, you know, there's this like completely like galaxy brain shit that people are working on. <laughs> and then there's industry trying to say, hey, the fees are high, right? Like It's just like this very sort of like, you know, grub, grub brain, sort of like fees high. I need solution, right? And then there is like, there's like millions of things going on in Bitcoin core development that may or may not affect that. And I got a, a vibe that like, you know, the intent of Optech was sort of like, okay, look, look, there's this massive gap. Can we start bridging this and involving industry and sort of like educating industry and, and sort of like keep tab of, of what people are working on? I mean, the newsletter helps developers keep tab of what's going on. So <laughs> that's, that's true. That's It's really the best resource um, week to week for what's kind of going on. But yeah, you're right. I mean, um, Optech was founded in 2018 on the heels of the 2017 bull run fee market. And, um, you know, initially uh, there was a lot of emphasis when we would go out and talk to various members of industry about how to kind of manage the fee market and how to use things like RBF, you know, so that exchanges were making the most efficient use of block space that they could. W what I think we found um, in practice many times was that exchanges were aware that they were aware that they were inefficient, but they just had kind of like bigger fish to fry from the standpoint of being a, you know, a corporate entity with shareholders and, or, or, yep. you know, profits to make. And, and so like the conclusion that I kind of came to was, well, it's, 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 if a business wants to ignore best practices and basically penalize themselves with fees, you know, it's fine with me to subsidize miners uh, and, and create a robust fee market. So I kind of like exited that conversation a little bit just because I I found it was very hard to get uptake. And it wasn't my position to try and sort of like push, yeah. you know, people. It's, it's, a, it's a tough position to be in, just generally speaking, right? I mean, like yeah. Bitcoin has a set of incentives, you know, it's money for your enemies and everybody's sort of like using differently. And they have both like overt and covert like incentives or sort of like a, a intentions, right? Uh, and we can't read people's minds, right? We can just work with the network thinking of like sort of like the worst case scenario and the best case scenario and sort of like, you know, aim somewhere where it makes sense for each feature. So like, let's, let's sort of like go back in time. How does this whole thing start? How did Bitcoin development start, right? I mean, you have Satoshi releases the paper, right? He releases the source code. Uh, I think it was on SourceForge at the time. And uh, conversations were had on email and on Bitcoin Talk, if I remember right. My memory is also failing of that time. So, so that's sort of like how it starts, right? I mean, and, and Satoshi has very sort of like unilateral decisions that he pushes into Bitcoin, right? Like, oh, I don't want Bitcoin block to be 32 megabytes. It's going to be uh, one, right? So like, boom, made a change. Push, nobody says anything. I, I read some of the discussion on the... Um on the Bitcoin talk forum for when Satoshi made those changes. And I think the, the change to one megabyte, the discussion wasn't even about that change. There was another That's change right. in that, um, in a pull request I'm saying between scare, scare quotes, cause he just pushed the change. Yeah. And th there were people commenting on that, even though two lines above there was the block size decrease. So that then makes you wonder whether there was some private communication about that, about that change or whether there was just no communication about the change and people didn't even know about it until much later. I like to assume there is always private communication. You know, I, I think it's a it's a better mental model for these things. You, you have to assume that people are colluding, good or bad, to try to get their preference ahead, right? Like, I mean, it's just the normal human thing to do. It's the natural market thing to do. Well, we know that Satoshi communicated directly with some people because some exactly. of the documents were released. So, so okay, so so we start that way, right? It's like, you know, there's... 50 people using Bitcoin at the time, right? Like, you know, then 100 and 200, like it kind of grew a little fast, like to a few thousand people within that sort of timeline. And uh, and the software is sort of like, you know, nobody, it's a very low stakes too, right? Like everybody, who who in their right mind would assume that this crazy idea would work, right? I mean, like you'd have to be like, like either a liar or crazy <laughs> to assume, especially if you're around those days and understand this. Like, I mean, it's, it's absolutely batshit crazy. So things are progressing, right? It's lower stakes. So people are less intense about things and people have a lot less of their bags depending on Bitcoin. 
And, and then we started having other people sort of like coming in and like you have like a personalities like Gavin, who sort of like, you know, tried to bring a little bit of the Linux sort of, uh, uh, let's call it, what is it, the, the benevolent, dictator, benevolent dictator, which was, uh, I don't think he lasted more than just a few months. I think everybody sort of like was a very sort of uh, affir- affirmative on the fact that he should uh, uh, sidestep that kind of intention. But... Uh, and maybe I'm um, sure as you can help me here with the history because I'm a little bit fuzzy, but um, I think one of the things that he kind of pushed through pretty controversially was pay to script hash. Is that right? Yes, uh, P2SH was. My understanding that yep. that is true, but I've only read like one long form article about it. I have not actually done any digging myself in that history. Yeah, there's also Op Eval that had like a, a recursive bug or something like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, ha- it had to be rewinded. Well, the word eval just the hell out of me because like in JavaScript, that's one of the ways you can get any kind of payload to execute in a browser. Uh, so if it was doing anything like that, like just evaluating stuff. There was a lot of stuff that was like, it could be seen as either incompetence or sketchy. This is around the time where, um, where Mike Hearn was also around and, and known, I don't know if it's true or not, as the guy who put the back door on Gmail. I'm not going to get into it because like the point of this Pod is not to create drama, to put any of the gas in any position where they don't want to be. You know, and this history is very complex, long and unclear as well. Uh, we're not here to discuss that on specifics. It's not the point. It's just to sort of like give a picture to people that don't know. Like the, the story on this is not like your traditional sort of like open source project where, you know, there is a core amount of people and some people actually like have the literal power to decide what goes in the next release, you know. It's a much more complex and fluid system, right? Yeah, in the beginning, I'm guessing it was more like a, a normal open source project. And right. it started evolving mm-hmm. to the point where developers realized they can't just unilaterally change things. Right. So, so let's then evolve to the, to the point where, you know, like post-Gavin era where, you know, he was still trying to split Bitcoin core from the wallet and all that stuff. And so like a little bit more modern history of Bitcoin, let's put it this way. Where it's like, okay, so we have this sort of like more functional thing. There's a lot of money in the system. You know, it's like sort of like less sketchy, quote unquote, kind of thing. It's kind of like moving on to GitHub where we have a lot of people working on it. You have issues. You have the mailing list now. Bitcoin Talks used a lot less. It just became sort of like more industry than than cottage industry, right? Mm-hmm. So, so now we have like GitHub, right? Like, and we have over what, almost 350 BIPs now. So let's say I wanted to make a change to, to Bitcoin, right? Like a non-contentious change, right? Like I just want to tweak a button on the UI or I want to change some help docs, right? Like how, how would I go about doing that? Well, you, I mean, so, so that's important to distinguish. I think we've done that in, you've at least done that in other episodes. Bitcoin Core is a giant blob of software that includes the supercritical consensus stuff that you really want to be careful with and also includes lots of other stuff that is just software. And it would be nice if it was separated, but that has been a a decade-long project that sometimes gets some renewed attention. But really, if it it were separated, then a lot of the things would be probably perceived as a lot less spectacular. Because, oh, you're just some guy working on a Bitcoin wallet rather than, oh, you're working on the Bitcoin Core wallet. It's like, well, you're working on the wallet that's sort of attached to Bitcoin Core like a Siamese twin and we can't take it out. But to answer your question, how do you then contribute? Let's say you find a typo in the readme. You go to github.com. You make what is called a fork. I think there's just one button in GitHub that says fork, the repo. Then on your own computer, you get some sort of code editor or for a readme, just notepad, I guess. You fix the typo. Then you have to figure out how Git works. But you can download like uh, something like the GitHub desktop client, which is pretty user-friendly. You make a commit. Then you... On your own branch, you push the branch. I mean, those, that's sort of the jargon, but you basically submit a pull request, which then other people can see as, hey, some person, and they'll see your picture or whatever pseudonym you picked, wants to make a change to Bitcoin. And other reviewers can then see what that change is. So they'll see only one line change is just a readme file. Then they'll say, okay, that looks good to me. In the case of like a simple typo fix, they'll say that. Or, you know, the discussion will be a lo- bit longer. And then if enough people have said that it's okay, which in the case of a typo would probably be just one person saying it's okay, one of the maintainers, we can, I guess, talk about it later, will hit the merge button. And that merge button basically puts 
your change into the master branch. And then it's just part of the Bitcoin software. And then at some point it gets released. But I think let me, yeah, let me pick up um, on that part of the story, because I think this is where Bitcoin gets very, very interesting and diverges from, you know, a lot of other, say, application development. Like if you're using some app on your phone, that is updated typically on kind of a push model. So like the developer pushes out a new update and then, you know, iOS or, or Android or whatever will we'll, we'll sort of like download that application involuntarily and give you a new version of it. When, when Bitcoin is released roughly every six months, users of Bitcoin have to voluntarily go and update the software. There's no like automatic update process. So when you go and add a button but why to the is wallet, that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, very important because the idea is, aside from, you know, any kind of like uh, deployment complexity that some kind of auto push thing would introduce, the idea is that users should be fully aware of what changes they're opting, opting into and they should sort of say, okay, yeah, I'm going to run this new version um, of Bitcoin that has, that, that has these differences from the old version. Well, let's just uh, give an example, right? Say, for example, like in the fork, war, like in the block wars, right? Somebody goes, say, like, this didn't happen, but uh, because the, the core devs sort of were trying to be neutral and, and also like, I'd imagine they'd probably be okay with me saying this, that the majority of them were for not making the blocks that huge. So say industry had enough weight, right? Or even say they paid GitHub to block everybody out. And, uh, and that's even a better a better idea. Uh, they paid GitHub to block everybody out. They change, they change the block size to 32 megabytes again or something, and they make a they make a release, right? If that release was automated, everybody would receive that, and now we would start making blocks with that size that were valid, and and it would be very hard to unwind that change. You'd probably have to just ignore those and keep those big blocks going forward, so you don't unwind it. Right. It's like, is that kind of scare? Like, I mean, there is a lot of things that could happen. You could have a change. You could have a hacker taking over GitHub. See, there is a trend there on GitHub being centralized. It doesn't quite work uh -huh. just like that. But, but to go on that into that rabbit hole, I think there was a way on Ubuntu to install uh, Bitcoin Core through the uh, apt repository. Yep. And that means if you do sudo apt install Bitcoin, that does get auto updated. And it gets yeah. auto-updated by whoever controls the, the Ubuntu re repository. So it's not even necessarily the Bitcoin core developers. So that's a bit scary. But generally, you have to go and download it yourself if you yes. want the new version. And so you can wait until, uh, see if there's a panic on Twitter. And if so, you maybe wait a little bit. And, and also, like, and then there's the keys, right? Like, there's a bunch of people who have keys. We can, we're going to get into that. But there's a bunch of people who have keys. And they all sign that release saying, hey, this release is good for me. This release is good for me. This release is good for me. How many people are now? Like five or 10? And then anybody else outside of those people who are known to have those keys also can do that, right? With Gideon, like anybody can go and sign and say, this one is good for me. So essentially you have a web of trust and you're vouching for that software because most people can't read the software. Yeah, though you have to sort of distinguish what exactly a Geek's, Geek's signature means. So, or Gideon in the old days. I, I personally think it the only thing it means is that the source code matches the binary. It does not necessarily like a seal of approval of the actual source code. So you may have some disagreements on that. Like I've, I've geek signed uh, Knox, N Knots, uh, Luke Dash's uh, version of, of Bitcoin Core, and I have not looked at that code myself. So I'm only I'm saying is like, if it's malware, it's because the, soft, the source code was malware. You know, it's kind of like a, a retweet. You know, like just because you retweet something doesn't mean you agree with it. Well, but it somehow, <laughs> some, somewhat implies it. So it's a bit of a gray area, but it is. But it's still a public service, right? You're at least vouching that that virus came from that source code. Uh, you can look back and say, hey, you know, it's just from like altering this or, or like uh, doing some fact finding there, right? Some audit. You could go and say, hey, you know, this this release was that source code. But that, so that's, um, you know, this Wall Street Journal article that just came out last week uh, called oh something boy. like, oh, the, the six <laughs> shadowy coders that control Bitcoin or, you know, whatever. The title was terrible. The contents wasn't too bad, but they do sort of miss the point. Yeah, I just, yeah, I think it's going to be probably interpreted by the layman in, in the wrong way, because uh, what, what would happen, like, let's say hypothetically tomorrow, you know, uh, one of the maintainers doubled the block subsidy. Right. And then, you know, merge that change, maybe even without a, a pull request. 
in actuality, what would happen is that code wouldn't be released for another few months. And then even if it were released, you know, um, I think probably nobody would run that binary because there would be enough people who noticed that change because, you know, we, we do comparisons between um, the last release version and kind of what all the, 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 the sum change set of the new version would be. You know, they'd see that and word would get out and nobody would run the software. But there is one more thing here, right? I mean, like Bitcoin is also the consensus of the network. So like realistically speaking, this consensus is so complex that like if people make some little changes here and there, they're likely to fork uh, and be out of consensus. So th there is a lot of risk in that, too. Well, but let's say they did it carefully and they, they just did a block size doubling. The other thing is that the software is not updated simultaneously because it's not automatic. So, and you might have exchanges that are running five-year-old versions of Bitcoin Core. Like that's not uh, that does actually happen. So that means that as soon as there is a split, because of some conspiracy, and it would have to be between the maintainers and a bunch of miners, you'd probably get a chain split, and some of the old nodes would not follow it. Some of the updated updated nodes would follow it. So there'd be all sorts of signals out there that there's something definitely bad going on. I, I mean, you know, a, a great source of security for Bitcoin is for people to run old nodes and run many versions of Bitcoin. That backwards compatibility that we have in Bitcoin is something very special in my view. Shameless uh, pointer to forkmonitor.info, which does that, right? Yeah, I think, I think the BitMEX folks run, run a bunch of those, including older Bitcoin Core, as well as uh, some of the other implementations like uh, LaBitcoin or BTCD. Yeah, I built that. So basically, uh, but it's for a BitMEX research app. So it runs a bunch of older nodes. It also runs different implementations. It used to run uh, LibBitcoin, but it became quite hard to run it. Hopefully they'll do a new release that's a bit, uh, that's quick again. Uh, I think it runs BTCD. Yeah. Yeah, while we're plugging monitoring platforms, I have Vmon, which, which runs old versions as well. And one of the interesting metrics that I was looking at actually today on Vmon is the difference in mempool size between contemporary node versions and old versions. Old versions don't permit taproot spends to propagate. And so their mempools are, are much smaller at this point than uh, contemporary versions. Well, I mean, and, and now people are going to want to probably increase their uh, their mempool size so that uh, the you know, the, the dick butts fit. <laughs> the mempool is much bigger. But, you know, I find it fascinating because technically, you know, like I, I like to think of the JPEGs now as uh, as essentially like a placeholder for interesting taproot transactions. It's just giving us a taste of what the future is going to look like with actual uh, mempool and block space used for things that are not extremely dense transactions. So, you know, we could see some crazy lightning channels with like a, a gazillion sort of intricacies that take, you know, 300, 500 kilobytes, right? And they may not be as dense with fees, right, for that amount of bytes. So they might be sort of floating to the top and you might not want to lose those, right? So you might want to increase the mempool space as well. It's a nice sort of like dry run for all that stuff with a sprinkle of drama. Totally. Okay, so so like... Taking this in a slightly different direction, who decides what gets worked on? So, so like, who's the boss of Bitcoin that says, "Hey, you know, I am, uh, I am a, a business and I need this done," or "I am a, a state actor, I want this done." Like, who, who decides what gets worked on? Well, a state actor is more than welcome to make a pull request, but then it'll be the state actor that has to hire, I guess, people who work for state actors to write code, and if that code is proper and doesn't have any sneaky backdoors in it, it might get a little bit more scrutiny because people would suspect backdoors in it. But if it's very clear that they're not, then that code would you know, get a bunch of people saying, this code looks good, it's doing something that's good, uh, let's merge it. But realistically speaking, right? So anybody who wants to change will have to do it themselves or, or hire somebody to do it for them. And then even though they've written all the code, they're still screwed because now they need to convince people that it's worth reviewing and worth merging. But even if people think it's conceptually a good idea, the review part is still going to keep you in limbo for a very long time. You get used to rebase. Well, this is like the change the code. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Change the code initiative, right? We're still, still waiting for that PR. Yeah, that's an example of how you're not supposed to do it. You're spending millions of dollars in, in screaming, please change the code. Even though they could have spent, you know, a tenth of that 
to have at least a bunch of students write some actual code, which would then have problems. But that's their intent, right? Their intent is is just to cause confusion and, you know, orchestra style. Well, it depends on who you mean by they, right? So if you mean the the Ripple founder behind it, maybe his, his mission is to just to disrupt Bitcoin. I don't know if that's Greenpeace uh, mission. I mean, maybe their mission is simply to take money and make a bunch of noise in a very like business way. Or maybe they really believe that this change is possible and that the way to get the change is to make a bunch of noise rather than to, you know, actually change the code. But, you know, we, we saw sort of like interesting kind of like, uh, I, I want to call it like time wasting, dramatic, completely irrelevant changes. Like when they changed the term blacklist. Mm. Right. Because it's a symbol of oppression or whatever. So like, you know, and GitHub actually changed from uh, master branches to main branches, which you have to go back in and change the default. So all your script breaks. So so anyway, so so like, but, but let's say this these are friendly sort of friendly actors, right? Like they actually want to work on some cool stuff or they want to hire people to work on some cool stuff and, and things that everybody wants. Right. Uh, how how do people go about that? How How do people just go and sort of like, hey, I want to I want this done. Right? I may not be a coder. I want, I want this amazing thing done and I'm willing to fund it. How, how would that, how would people go about that? Yeah, I mean, this is another one of the ways that Bitcoin's really unique and unlike any other open source project or even software project in that <clears throat> there's really no, there's no roadmap. There's no centralized roadmap. There's no indication of like priorities other than, you know, occasionally individuals might write a blog post saying, hey, this is what I care about. This is what I think should be worked on. So if, if you're a new contributor looking to get involved, it's really pretty, pretty tough because you kind of are responsible yourself for ascertaining like what's valuable to work on, what, what would people be receptive to. And then if you're like, say, a company who, who wants something done, that's that's almost an even that's that's more clear than being an individual contributor and wanting to get involved, because I think your move there is to go to the GitHub issue queue, write up what you want, kind of justify it with rationale. And that actually that might be very welcome because there are a number of people out there who are like, yeah, I want to get involved. I want to help this thing out. I want to write some code, but I just have no idea where to start. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's, you know, personally, that's one of the really frustrating parts of the project. And and the, the, the people who, a lot of the people who have quit, I think quit out of frustration because they're just in this position where they've done some valuable work, but it just kind of sits there and languishes and they have to rebase it. And it, it's just this real, like in Bitcoin, you do like, you know, 10, five to 10% of the work that you do is like writing the initial prototype code draft, putting it out there. And then like the remaining 95 to 90% is like addressing feedback, you know, rebasing, just really mundane, awful. I mean, you got to rebase, <laughs> right? Because yeah. and you want to keep that, uh, that up to date because when people do have the time to come review your PR, Right. You want that to be like tip top and ready to go because in a mergeable state. Yeah, exactly. Right. Because that might be your your chance of the year. Right. Yeah. Uh, sure. I was going to say, but then you do rebase. And then once in a while, somebody comes by and says, hey, don't rebase this stuff. I want to be able to run it on top of an older branch of Bitcoin. Core. <laughs> uh, that's happened to me a few times, not very often and usually by one person. There's a few different things that uh, are in play there. Of course, we talked about anybody, you know, Shores walked through how you could open up a PR and update the README and potentially you find an issue that you'd like to work on and you can work on that. There's a little bit of odds with what you may want to work on and what is valuable to the reviewers and to the maintainers. And while there is no Bitcoin core roadmap, I do think that there's value in seasoned contributors telling the world what they're working on and plan to work on, because I think that can solve two issues. Um, One is reviewers or maintainers taking a look at uh, new PRs that people who are just eager to help are putting together and it's potentially low value PRs or distracting. Um, At least some folks can interpret it in that way. And then secondly, some established contributors are also looking for people to help with their particular project or piece of the code that they're working on. And so by coming up with something like a personal roadmap or writing up a project that you're working on and where uh, new contributors can potentially help you, 
you solve both of those issues because now you're, you're not getting maybe a superfluous PR to the repository. So you don't have to worry about review time on that. But now, not only that, but you're also now getting a pull request that is interesting for you if, if you're uh, an established contributor. Um, so that's, that's something I'm interested in. Just as point of clarification, Brink as an organization that funds open source development work, including on Bitcoin Core, explicitly, I, I do not want to be, and, and the board and the grant committee do not want to be directing what our grantees are are working on. And so I'm very sensitive to that. But I do think it's interesting if they, on their own volition, would come up with something like, here's what I'm working on. Here's what's important to me. If you open up a PR with this, I'm more likely to review it and help you and potentially mentor you. You you know, I personally have no issues if you guys wanted to sort of like dictate what you want to see exist. Like, I I actually, if anything, I, I love the the market honesty on something like that, not to say that it's dishonest what you do at all. Like I understand where you guys are coming from and trying to sort of remain out of the politics while supporting the project. But I, I love when like industry comes and say, hey, I'm willing to pay for somebody to do this thing because one, I don't think I'm breaking the system, right? Like it, it's an earnest sort of intentional thing, right? Like say Stratum V2 or something, right? Like I, I'm a miner. I really want to see like better a better way of doing coordination of new blocks and I'm willing to pay for it. And, uh, you know, some people may not like it, you know, it's still fair, but like, I, I really want to fund this. Like, you know, like can everybody who wants to work on it lift their hands and, you know, like, and I'm going to help you guys economically and whatever. Right. Like, I, I think it's, it's important for people to know that there is space for that as well. Like, we don't have to all be like Brink where it tries to remain outside of this, which is used to be the, the traditional model, right? Like uh, uh, most entities that do fund Bitcoin develop, core development try to stay out so that, you know, it doesn't murky the waters and stuff. But I think when there's like a clear business go and it's like a nice, it's like a source of truth, right? Like it's obvious, like these people are not being, even if I don't agree, they're not being CDs or anything. This is like, you know, this is what they're trying to accomplish, right? Like this is how they make money. Yeah, I, I think there's there's uh, Im- implicit or explicit direction. Obviously, uh, I'm saying that Brink is not trying to direct our grantees explicitly, but you could always say, and this is true, the fact that we've chosen those grantees and the projects yep. that they've chosen to work on is an implicit endorsement of that. And I, I think that that's okay. Um, and obviously we're comfortable with that because you do need to make a decision on what you think is the most impactful work that could be done on the project, given the grantees that are applying in, in our case. Right. Um, there are projects, uh, sections of, of code that would make up something called a project that I think the industry could fund and, and not get much backlash. So like, for example, like the 322 in generic sign, sign message is something that I've heard that uh, there's some identity folks interested in, in funding, for example. And there, I don't know, there's been some talk about that now with this ordinals project that that sign message may, may be valuable. And so something like that may be innocuous, whereas something more consensus related, like if you're funding, trying to get a uh, new opcode or in or something like that, maybe more controversial. Maybe James has some thoughts on that. I don't know. You know, I think it's important for people to like not be shy about airing their business intentions. You know, sometimes it's beneficial to them to just shut up and not because, you know, they want to get that thing in, but they don't want their competitor to maybe push it against it. Right. But generally speaking, I think it's a nice thing to do because, you know, uh, Bitcoin enemies, right? Like we're state actors or things like that. They're not going to be nice, kind and like, you know, go and say, hey, I'd love to fund people and sort of like be quiet about it. Right. So they're going to be completely, completely covered. And they're going to like, you know, like do all this with all this sort of like literally evil intent towards the project. Right. So it's anyways, I just I like to air out the laundry of Bitcoin, I think is important and it's good for it. Without sort of like delaying people from their works. Um, I, I suspect that there's not a lot of uh, companies that have a very specific thing that they want to change in Bitcoin Core that would warrant finding, recruiting a full-time developer. My guess is there may be occasionally, you know, if they're using Bitcoin Core in their environment, there might be occasionally a bug or whatever. But I think at that point, it's easier for them to just get one of their own staff to figure out how to fix it. 
But the idea that a business would depend on like a, a new opcode or anything like that, that's such a long-term game anyway. I'll, I'll give you some examples. Yeah. For example, think about like, uh, you know, Lightning Labs and all the Lightning Network people. They needed malleability to be fixed and some of the features of SegWit in order to exist. Lightning would not have existed in, in any form that's actually usable, mm-hmm. right? Under the original set of, of primitives and constructs that Bitcoin had, right? So they actually made a push and funded and helped sort of like push changes that like would benefit and make them exist as a business. Let's see, for example, Stratum V2, right? Miners, like a lot of miners, especially non-public traded miners want that to happen because it does protect them in many different ways with more privacy, with, you know, give them more speed. And so like, there is like, I wouldn't say like, you know, a business is unlikely to need a specific feature. Maybe OpVault would be great. Like I can see how a a business would need that. Like specifically, I need this so that I can do like large custody, you know, for like institutional clients, because that's the only way I can do it. Right. Like I can totally see that happening. But Stratum V2, you can see the other approach, which is just build your own software project because Stratum yep. V2 in principle is its own software project. Now, right. at some point, there may be some things that they'll need uh, a tweak to Bitcoin Core for uh, in order to make it That's work. That's often how it is, right? Mm-hmm. Like the business will have this thing, but then they need a few little tweaks to Bitcoin so that like their thing actually works in a sort of like performant way, right? Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, you, you could imagine that in many cases, a business might make those tweaks and they might just run a patched version of Bitcoin D. Like in the case of mining, I know there are people out there who want to solo mine, who don't want to use Stratum because there's a tremendous amount of overhead in terms of doing the paper share accounting and all that. And what they really would like is to, to get frequent block template pushes, right? And that's something that you can kind of just like patch onto Bitcoin and run in a pretty low risk way. I mean, obviously there's a little bit of annoyance having to have a deploy pipeline that like patches a, a version of Bitcoin builds it, but it's not that a huge a deal. So I, I, I really, I mean, my take is like, I don't see anybody pushing for changes in, in Bitcoin in, in any kind of a, like setting aside malignance, but like in a sort of thoughtless way, I think, you know, a lot of the, say, um, uh, stuff that like uh, Blockstream is experimenting with, um, you know, the op codes that they have for transaction introspection, like that obviously has applications for their liquid stuff. But like, that's a, you, you can make the argument that that stuff is very generally useful and it's, you know, research that's really worth doing. So I think at this stage of the game, I, I really don't see anything, even if you're talking about consensus proposals that are, that are anywhere near the sort of uh, nature of like, say, the block size increase proposals, which even then, I mean, I mean, you know, maybe a lot of people who wanted the block size increase, maybe, you know, their motivations were probably um, genuine in the sense that they just want to see Bitcoin fees. scale. Yeah, they want to lower, lower the fees. They want to, they want to see Bitcoin adoption continue and, and so on and so forth. But uh, yeah, at, at this stage in the game, like maybe there will come a time where we where we see proposals that are kind of at the expense of some particular user group. But I, I think right now, luckily, everybody just wants to see Bitcoin kind of prosper, as far as I can tell. The segway to X uh, thing was interesting, right, to watch that because the, there were attempts to increase the block size, like smaller pull requests by, by experienced developers like Gavin, but they never really got through. But then once a bunch of companies decided that they wanted this segway to X uh, alternative client, uh, they forked the repo and and hired. I think they. I don't. I don't know if they paid him, but I'm assuming they paid uh, Garzik to do it. So that's an example of you can hire an existing developer to do something specific for you. Uh, now this didn't work out because it was just too hard for one person to do. But you know. yeah, so so that sort of like leads me to sort of like the next thing, which is like who chooses what gets merged, and how how does something gets actually merged because. You know, if one thing I think a lot of people already understand is that like changes are excruciatingly reviewed, right? Even minute changes. And that's likely why we don't see malicious changes at attempts, right? Because you become very clear very fast. So who are the people who, who you know, gets to merge it? It's a, a really subtle and difficult thing to explain because on, on, on the one hand, the line that we all like to recite is that maintainers are just janitors and really they act as a kind of conduit to express the 
broader desires of the technical community. And like at face value, that's absolutely true. The more complicated nuanced reality is that oftentimes maintainers are seen as like technical leaders. They are in that position for a reason because people broadly trust their judgment. And so people, whether they subconscious or not, they pay a lot of attention to what those maintainers are doing and, and what they like. And the so proverbial I, gray beards. Yeah, the gray beards. Exactly. So, you know, I, I, I do think there's definitely a Bitcoin ivory tower and Bitcoin is very, very difficult because to understand it from first principles is not something almost anybody can do. And so what happens is in the community, you have varying degrees of technical capability, varying degrees of actually evaluating proposals. And what happens is people sort of rely on the heuristic of like, who do I trust? Who's going to give me kind of a notion of what this change actually is and whether it's a good thing. And, and so you're in this situation where there's like a very small number of people who are kind of upstream of the technical consensus around something and every, everybody else to varying degrees just kind of like sort of follows along. But to get to the, the question of what should happen in kind of in theory, I guess, and it, I think it happens mostly in practice too, is there is a bunch of people who review code and then there is a group of about five or six whitelisted people, essentially, that we call maintainers, who can hit the merge button on GitHub. Now, in fact, we don't, this is kind of weird, because GitHub itself, we don't know, it's a centralized company, we don't know what it's doing. You can't see it from the outside world. It could have so been maybe, somebody else. Maybe I can hit the merge button, I don't know. I mean, provided it was not signed, right? Technically, they could yeah. download they could merge it locally, sign it, and then push it back. So, th so but, there's a group of people that are listed in a text file by their PGP key. And the idea there is that they, when they merge something into Bitcoin Core, not only do they hit the button on GitHub, they don't hit the button on GitHub because they have to run a bunch of scripts. They have to PGP sign the fact that they merged it. And then there's a script called verify commits, which is does have problems, but it's there that will actually go through recent commits and make sure that it was only those maintainers doing it. Um, so there's a, but basically you can just look at the GitHub history and, and see that these merges are done by that fairly small number of people. And then you, you kind of have to check, I guess, spot check or trust or whatever you want, that they are following a process that when they merge something, you can go back and see what they merged and you can look at that progress and see the discussion. And if if the discussion is full of developers saying, no, this is horrible, don't don't merge this, and yet they merge it, then, you know, that's probably a situation. But usually what you'll see is other developers with experience in that area saying, okay, this looks good. And so then like that goes sort of like back to this, right? Like where, you know, that article, for example, that, you know, it's in the hands of six shadowy super coders, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, practically, but no, technically, right? So like, you, you know, th these are people who are trusted to do some of this work, but, you know, like, there is a lot of people who understand Bitcoin enough to understand that change that just happened, right? They may not have been as technical to sort of invent that change, right? Which is often the case, right? Like some crazy, amazing cryptography was invented to do something or some, some new way of doing blocks like segregated witness or something like that, right? But people who there, there is a next level of people there who it is a much larger group who can review that and say, mm, you know, like, can you please clarify it here? So even if they hit the button, because we don't have automated uh, software pushes and uh, updated sort of like a software update, the alarm would be sound. Well, and also you're running, you know, lots of people will run not the releases, but the master branch, right. so the in-progress version. And that those people include pretty much all of the developers who are working on trying new features. And they'll often find bugs that were accidentally merged, right? Some, there's lots of pull requests in Bitcoin Core that are just fixing little things that were broken by pull requests because they were missed in the review. So th it does get a lot of eyes on it. Even if you didn't review the pull request yourself, like I sometimes find a pull request because it, I'm working on another pull request and, and whatever just got merged just broke my work. And so I have to go in and look like, what the hell were they changing? Why? And then, you know, I'll say, oh, okay, whatever, it's fine or not. So there's a lot of eyes on it. Yeah. So like, you know, we could almost divide, like this discussion kind of happens like when in the minutia they happen on GitHub, right? So like you're going to have literally code line comments, right? You're going to have issue comments. You're going to have PR level comments. And there's a lot of discussion that happens there. Uh, PR comments, they start getting a little bit more abstract, not necessarily to the specifics. 
but the knit picks, the knits are really done on a line level uh, or cold mm-hmm. block level. And then the, the PR discussions often sort of spill either from or to the mailing list. And it, it all like maybe people don't understand how the mailing list work. Do, do you guys want to explain how the Bitcoin mailing list like exists? That's pretty rare, though. I would say the amount of pull requests that have overlap with what happens on the mailing list is probably 1%. But those are the ones that are the biggies. Mm-hmm. Well, th- yeah, because they might in- influence some sort of uh, either consensus or at least at the peer-to-peer level. For RBF, right? That was one that spilled over from GitHub back to the mailing list. And, and, and it's normal. Like, it's fair. I mean, like, people should find clarification, right? You know, for the people that don't know, the Bitcoin dev mailing list is, is this sort of like a, like a, a traditional email mailing list where anyone can email there. There is moderation, right? So if you just send an email saying, you know, like, fuck you all or love you all, it's definitely not going to make it. It's not how you submit your inscription. That's right. But, you know, like even trolley sort of like valid questions or points are often let in because it's important to let a lot of that in. Just don't expect people to respond, <laughs> you know, if, if, you, if it's too out of scope. Right. IRC might be a better place to go ask that. Often the idea of the mailing list is like things that could be a little bit more constructive. They need a little broader audience, uh, including business, uh, to be sort of purview to or to announce. Right. Like, hey, I have a new proposal. I have a new idea. You know, sometimes the back and forth will happen there. Sometimes will happen right where you have your your BIP being uh, drafted. So that brings us to BIPs. (laughs) Bitcoin improvement proposals. What are BIPs? BIPs are, I guess, like a very technical specification of some, you know, idea that that's relevant to Bitcoin. It doesn't even have to be something that goes into Bitcoin Core or the protocol. It could be some kind of a wallet format or, you know, a strategy for using Bitcoin in some way. Um, but it's really, they're really just, um, if, if you're familiar with like the way the internet was designed, it's almost like an, R, uh, an RFT. RFT, yeah. So like... You know, would you say like maybe people like I, I just saw this sort of like slight drama with the ordinals uh, BIP being introduced, right? And it, it all like the arguments are kind of fair in one side because you know it feels a little trolly, but I know Casey, so like I know it was not meant that way. You know, it's a fair technical proposal too, and I think people get get confused if like what makes it as a BIP number, a BIP draft, doesn't mean it's gonna make it to Bitcoin. Right. It's just like, hey, we have this formal proposal. Right. It's a guideline to do something. It's an idea. It's an idea that's very complete. Right. It's like technically sort of like valid. Right. Uh, Which is all wishy-washy. I know I'm being wishy-washy, but that's what we have to work with here. And it's and you know what? Like it is it is warranted to exist in, in, in the Bitcoin ripple. Right. Because, you know, it's affecting people. There's people using maybe this idea or there's people that really want to make this idea happen. That's at least how I feel about BIPs. So, you know, you could actually quiet the discussion by just adding the damn thing and and then like, you know, boom, let it have it there and now have the discussion under the BIP. I guess the counterpoint would be that, you know, and I don't know how I feel about the ordinals, but it's probably fine to add, but um, the counterpoint would be like, there's all kinds of stuff. There's an infinite number of things you can do on top of Bitcoin. And so the idea that like every time we come up with a new way to do something and somebody writes up a, a, a media wiki document, like, the idea that, that we would like spam the BIPs repo with all these different things you could do with Bitcoin at, at a certain point that just uh, gets ridiculous, right? I know I agree. And, and, and that's why it's this sort of wishy-washy, depending on the people of the day, really, if it's going to make, make it as a BIP or not. I mean, listen, if it's going to go on the protocol, right, if it's going to actually have a meaningful change to the actual Bitcoin code and the actual Bitcoin consensus, it, it's, it's almost like 100% chance it's going to be a BIP. But I wouldn't put too much value on whether something gets a BIP number, right? You can write a Bitcoin improvement pro- a proposal and put it on your own website and sure. have, it have the same format as any other BIP, but it won't get a number because whatever politics. Now, the argument of having too many different proposals that are what you can do as a, as a sort of a layer on top of Bitcoin, I guess, well, you can make a separate thing like Lightning has its own repo with its own proposal. Lightning doesn't make BIPs, they have bolts. So you can say, okay, there is now a new repo for things that you're publishing on the blockchain that have no consensus meaning. Uh, you know, you can just describe counterparty there, give it number one and describe uh, this guy, uh, the inscriptions and whatever, 
call it number two. So that's just a matter of where you want to keep the information. I don't think that matters. So I, I think I think the original sin of BIPs is not having a stricter sort of like a, a set of requirements that you have to meet in order to make it as a BIP. That's my opinion, my personal opinion. This is not like the people who work on that opinion. I don't know what their opinion is. It might be the same, might not. But like the, the issue is like we have a lot of BIPs, a lot of BIPs. They'll never make it to Bitcoin that like are interesting ideas, but you know, it's just not going to happen. Or there's things... There are things that are just not implemented. Then there is a lot of Bitcoin features that never made it into BIPs, even though they're referenced as BIPs, like BIP, is it 44 or 84? I think it's 84. There is no BIP that defines that derivation path, even though it gets referenced everywhere, because the other derivation has a BIP that represents that number. So listen, it's open source. It's a, it's a rough consensus, right? So of course, the things that we use as documentation, implementation, and building blocks are going to be messy too, right? And and I think like people have trouble sort of like accepting that it's not going to be clean and pretty. BIP 84 exists. Is, then it's 44 that was missing. But, well, there's a lot missing, right? So the, the, the numbering system of the BIP is more mysterious than ordinals. <laughs> <laughs> They're not continuously numbered from zero to N. They, they, are come, they tend to come in groups of 10 uh, where they might start numbering from like, you know, 21, 22, 23, and then there might be another series, 40, 41, 42. So there, there is some logic there that exists, I believe, in uh, Luke's brain, but it may have been documented too. Tonal. It, it's in tonal. <laughs> that could be. So the taproot bits, you know, are 340, 341, 342, but uh, there's a lots of unused numbers there. So Rodolfo, are you saying that you think the BIP repo is, is too liberal on letting things in? Is that your point? I think so. I, I I mean, you know, I'm the kind of person that prefers a little bit more of a some general sets of rules, right? Just to avoid conflict. The rules can be changed. I'm cool with that. Like, it's more like, hey, let's just have like, let's only add bips that like we should add all of them. Every idiosity that people come up with, as long as they have like some minimum, you know, technical merit to it let's put it this way right i think bip2 actually puts some constraints and like it has to have some technical merit but those should be drafts they should not be assigned numbers maybe they can have the draft number which is a different than the final number but like it should be a different folder in a different repo right so it's like all the stuff that you want to come up with just so it gets like it's really cool that things get documented even stupid ideas even like evil ideas or whatever right like I mean, we should document all this stuff. 7,000 years from now, you go to this library, there's all this cool shit. I think you're prematurely optimizing it. There's, there's one, there used to be only one maintainer up until like a year ago when a second was added, which uh, I don't think they're being completely overwhelmed by the number of new uh, bit requests coming in. Right. But well, people are also scared. I've, I've met enough people that had very interesting ideas that I believe should be BIPs. They just don't do it because, you know, everybody is terrified of having to deal with it, right? So so they just write a proposal and don't give it a number and put it on the mailing list. Right. Well, that's the other problem, right? Then the mailing list, I find that the mailing list audience is slightly different than the, than the BIP actual. It, it's like you get a different type of response and you get like a, it's, it's a very, like, a, it, it's a it's a fault of the medium. Well, you get the best responses once you've actually implemented something like working code uh, either in Bitcoin Core or somewhere else, depending on what, what the thing is that you're working on, then you'll get feedback from the relevant people. If you're just writing yes. a sort of a, a high-level proposal, yeah, then you're going to No, get it doesn't belong in a BIP. High-level stuff, you need to have like pseudocode. You have to have like like a, a true representation of what is it that you want to implement as a BIP, right? At least that's my view. But if you're putting something on the mailing list that's not very fleshed out, then the people who are going to respond to that are the people who are into things that are not very fleshed out. Right. The rest will either ignore you or because they'll be tired of, of even pointing out that your proposal is not fleshed out enough. Right. So, so my idea is, you know, like have a, a slightly better improved set of rules and then just dump them in a separate repo, right? Like we call that the, the library of BIPs, right? And then you can categorize them as like the forgotten, the forbidden, the, you know, like whatever you want. I don't want to see this long winding discussion about meta, what has to go in a BIP or not. You, you just, you don't want this. Yeah. When I was doing a Sumo UTXO, I, I, I didn't do a BIP for that. 
partly at the time because I, I think I was intimidated, but partly because it seemed like an implementation detail for Bitcoin Core. And so I was like, okay, well, this doesn't need to be. I, I would say Zoom UTXO definitely deserves a BIP if somebody else yeah. wants to do it because yeah. it's not something that should only work in Bitcoin Core. And you know, you might want to build tooling around it too. So just selfishly speaking, like I don't want to go read the discussion first. Right. I want to go read the paper first, right? So like having that BIP. Right. Even if it's unassigned numbers, just by name. Right. In some separate repo. So we're not polluting the same Git file. Right. It's very useful. Very useful. Right. So you go read it like, OK, this is interesting. And then you go check out the discussion, which it could be, you know, like one dude having no objection to like, you know, the whole sort of Internet hating on it. Right. With James's proposal with the vaults. Uh, now you have a PDF, which describes the initial idea. Mm-hmm. Then there is a BIP and there's an implementation. And I love that. On the mailing list. That is clarity. Good. The only no, problem clarity is, is good. Yeah, but the only problem is if you go to the PDF, that's from like early January. And so the actual implementation has changed based on discussion on the mailing list. Mm-hmm. So it's actually a kind of a pain for you, I guess, to keep keep all that up to date. I mean, I, ideally, I would want a PDF that also updates with the latest proposal so that I can read the very high level. Personally, I don't like PDFs. Yeah, no, screw PDFs. Markdown. It's all written. In, I assume it's written in Markdown and then yeah. you generate the PDF so you can read the original Markdown. My point is that... No, I wrote it in LaTeX. No! Oh, but you can write um, with Pandoc, you can write yeah. Markdown, which is converted but, to LaTeX and then... Yeah, it. but the formatting isn't as nice. You don't get as much control. <laughs> I wanted to make I wanted to make a nice looking paper. Pandoc is extremely powerful. I would not underestimate. You know, do the PDF once it goes in. <laughs> I spent a, a ridiculous amount of time fiddling with the layout of my book, like figuring out how to get Pandoc to do certain things. That's true, uh, but anyway, the, the, it's nice to have like a high level document, like a pretty PDF, and then a BIP, and then you know you can see the mailing list discussion. But yeah, anyway, and there's actually versioning new venue that you want your idea or your code to get in. And this is something that James is working on, which is this Bitcoin inquisition. James, as as part of the, the, the process or what you're going through, do do you, do you see that you want to have op vault activated there now? Is that like the, the playground where ideas that are truly valuable get uh, activated in Bitcoin inquisition? Yeah, I, I think so, because, you know, it used to be if you wanted to play with a pending soft fork, you had to wait until that soft fork got enough consensus to go to testnet, and then you could do testnet transactions. But a soft fork being on testnet kind of signifies that it's slated for mainnet. So Inquisitions is nice because we can just kind of do whatever we want there and play with ideas and actually have, you know, persistence in terms of test data. Uh, so yeah, I, I think uh, I think it's a great institution. I mean, obviously, Vaults hasn't hit Inquisition yet, but I'm I'm really hopeful for it. But does Inquisition run on the regular Signet? Yeah, because in principle, you can have a custom Signet for every single software proposal. Yeah, but I guess it's nice to have a lot of sample transactions in a real blockchain and faucets and infrastructure like that ready to go. Yeah. And I think the idea is to sort of measure how any given proposal interacts with totally unrelated stuff, you know, so you would want some un- unrelated traffic. So Inquisition combines all the code then? It, it somehow yeah. like takes all, these, takes all these pull requests and, and adds them together. That's pretty Yeah, and it's, it's, it's kind of a pain because now I have two things to rebase whenever anything changes. And you do have to make some material changes to, to what, you know, what you're proposing because the existence of other soft forks um, changes the code in, in non-trivial ways. So it's a little bit of a pain, but I think it's probably worth it. So you can actually have op CTV. Yeah, right. Right now he's merged APO, CTV, and uh, hopefully pretty soon Vault. Very cool. I, I mean, it's, it's it's Bitcoin is very complex, and it's very hard for us to find out if there is any problems, right? And even with the implementations, they use the new features too. So you know, like having having ways of testing this with like a, a good amount of transaction data is is kind of a big deal. This is it is a bit strange though because the the idea of testnet was to just test things. But typically when you want to do something on testnet, it should be probably be merged into Bitcoin Core, even if it's only active on testnet. And here, I mean, Signet should be no different in principle, because Signet is just the same as, as testnet in, in that sense. But now what you're doing is you're you're taking a different repository and you're merging these these experimental softworks in there. And then the consensus is informed 
is enforced by the people who run that particular signet, which in this case is two people. I, I guess it works. It's a different model to just try things out on a, on an experimental blockchain without merging it into Bitcoin Core because that, I guess that act of merging is is seen as a bit too much endorsement. Mm-hmm. And also it makes it very hard to change anything else, right? Because you are touching consensus code. Even if you're saying skip this line if you're on testnet, that could right. still be a very, very bad bug on mainnet. Yeah. Yeah. So as a side note here, like this is a constant sort of like thing that gets brought up. Like is GitHub centralization a risk? It's a risk, yes. It's a realistic risk. Well, it depends on risk for what, but it's it's such a useful tool that if we get rid of it, yeah, it'll be a bit safer, but we'll move about 10 times slower. But you see, like people tend to think that like, you know, we are at risk, right? Like it's always like, you know, like the airplanes are going to fall out the sky kind of risk, right? You know, I, I think it could be a nonsense and annoying and, and not like we wouldn't be as productive. But like, again, like we are all saying, right, Git is decentralized and everybody has a copy of everything and everybody has signatures and, you know, we can move to Git labs and, you know, we would might, might even lose the the issues, which would really suck. But, you know, I have a feeling that somebody out there is keeping a copy. Let's say, you know, GitHub could just change the code from under us, but that's why we have all these signatures. So that's pretty easy to detect and make a bunch of noise about. They can mess with the release tags, I guess, but the releases are on a different website anyway than GitHub, the the actual downloads that we give to people. So I'm not sure. Well, there's also like the Tornado Cache example where they just decided to take down the repository completely. And I know that got the heckles up of at least some of the Bitcoin developers that were worried that, well, maybe the sky isn't falling today, but they've definitely shown that things can fall from the sky if if you, you rub people the wrong way. And so I know there's at least some experimentation going on right now with mm-hmm. trying to mirror the repository um, to maybe GitLab, GitLab hosted, maybe um, a GitLab self-hosted and seeing what that mapping looks like. Because yes, Git is decentralized, but a lot of the, the goodies and niceties and even things like you know, emoji reactions, you know, up, down, vote, you know, the, the, you know uh, those sorts of things maybe don't have a mapping. So it's a matter of figuring out what gets mapped over and could get mapped over so that you don't lose all that productivity. If GitHub were to go down, I think it would be quite chaotic for a period, although it wouldn't be obviously a, a existential threat to Bitcoin in any way. It's the metadata and, and the logic, right, that GitHub have that that's quite good. Yeah. There, By the way, there is a 12 BTC bounty for somebody to create a, a GitHub alternative on Oster. So like, and I think you'll probably get upped if somebody showed that they were uh, producing something interesting. Yeah, I think this general sentiment is that GitHub is good as long as it's there, but we should always assume that it may disappear from one moment to the other. So the, the, the thing to be worried about is making sure that we have backups of everything that happens there. And then there will be some period of interruption. It'd be nice if we have a backup plan ready that you know really works. But meantime, GitHub provides some really good tools. Just It's it really in the small things. Like I can look at a couple lines of code somewhere, then I can click on the blame button and see who was the last person changed it. And I can look at it, dig back right to the pull request and see all the discussion around that line of code. So it's a very good way to just get information about how, how things work and where they came from. And it's a very low barrier to entry. Somebody who has experience working on any other GitHub project will understand how to do this. When Whereas every time I have to make a contribution to a GitLab project, I get confused. It's, it's not a very nice interface. So it's it's there it's like a bunker, but uh, I hope we don't need it. You know, I always joked about uh, what's the name of that uh, the, the Adobe competition on Linux. I keep on saying to them, don't try to invent something. You just copy Photoshop, please. Oh, GIMP. Yeah. So like, please just keep all the buttons exactly the same. <laughs> but a lot of the other scenarios that people would be worried about by thinking GitHub is centralized, like, yeah, GitHub itself could start messing with the code. Those kind of scenarios, I think, would also exist if the thing was more centra- decentralizedly hosted mm-hmm. because then you have to trust whoever is behind well, that. Well, even more, right? Because Microsoft has yeah. a reputation here too, right? I mean, they don't they don't want to be known for the people who like rug pull like software out of people. It, it's kind of a biggie. Yeah, mm-hmm. and if it's just like one core dev who happens to run a little server, then he gets compromised. Even unknowingly, the server gets taken over by the NSA and then 
the sneaky backdoor will be put in there closer to the release in a way that's a little bit more subtle mm-hmm. uh, by also using a compromised PGP key of that same maintainer. Yeah, something like that. I, I think the biggest risk with Git, like realistic, <laughs> practical risk is like, for example, say China tells GitHub, don't show the Bitcoin ripple to Chinese people. Because GitHub's still there, right? Like all the devs are there, but they just can't work on that repo, right? Uh, you, you're going to probably see a lot of that going on as we, as we go forward, as things get a little bit more weird. But it's not going to be like a full yeah, on. That, that could be an argument for having a, a good mirror somewhere so that people can keep contributing on some other website. But I guess with mm-hmm. China, it's such a whack-a-mole game that even having a mirror, just they'll just crush the mirror. If If they want to not have the Bitcoin repo accessible to developers in China... There's no point in going to some other site because there'll be one guy in charge of making sure that happens. And if that guy sees the mirror, then we'll add that to the list. So, guys, like, you know, to, to, to go into a, a more difficult topic here, first is like who chooses the, the activation method and uh, what are the activation method options? And like, how, how this whole messy shit works? I mean, you know, like it's always dramatic. Uh, it has not been sort of like flushed out, and I don't believe it ever will. Just the nature of the project. But like we talked about the changes, but like a lot of changes require a soft fork or a hard fork could be. So you know, we have to have ways of doing that safely, and we have to have ways of signaling and 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 creating consensus and displaying consensus. You know, I'm a big fan of Flag Day, Game of Chicken. I really don't like the speedy trial stuff, you know, a lot through, you know. So, so like, uh, as default, so but that, those are my sort of things. But, like, how, how Actually, do you guys feel about this from more like a, yeah. Yeah, Rodolfo, can you, can you describe what you don't like about speedy trial? Because from what I know, all speedy trial is saying is basically... Like, hey, we're, we're going to do a short period where if all the miners absolutely want this thing, then they signal so. Otherwise, we're just going to fall back to something else later on that, that's going to be more lengthy. Like, what what is your objection to that? So I don't want to give miners an upper hand in the dynamic, right? It, it is a very slight and very subtle upper hand that we give with speedy trial to them. We essentially let them show to each other, right, that, they, that the miners themselves have consensus. So they could be trying things that would be beneficial to them and not beneficial to, to economic nodes, right? And sort of like using this mechanism covertly, right? To sort of try to signal to each other, okay, you know what? Like, hey, oh, look, we have consensus. You know what I mean? It, it's, but then uh, you don't like the whole idea of using miners to activate soft works. I mean, the, 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 there is an actual dependence on miners when you want to activate a soft work in a way that's safe. That's just, that dependence is there. Because you want the majority of miners to enforce it so that people who upgrade more slowly don't get fooled by by all sorts of chain splits. I don't I don't also have like a good answer either. I mean, aside from the fact that I'm perfectly fine with the game of chicken. I think that's how it should be. I am not fine with the game of chicken at all. <laughs> so sh- I'll just shamelessly plug that I wrote a whole chapter on, on software activation in my book. Which everyone should read, by the way. The book is called Bitcoin, a work in progress. By it's Shorsh. a cool book. Thank it's you. A great book. So basically, I, I kind of went through like you know Satoshi was just activating soft forks sneakily, really, mm-hmm. and then things got better with things like BIP nine, and then there was a lot of drama around Segwit, and in my opinion, we just had a bit of post traumatic stress syndrome from Segwit, so that we made more of a fuzz of Taproot than was was necessary. My guess is would have been fine with BIP nine, especially given what happened to Speedy Trial, and the the drama just delayed activating the whole thing because as soon as there's drama a lot of bitcoin developers will be like okay i'm just gonna sit in a little corner away from the drama and i will come back when the drama is over and then the lack of action will cause more drama let me let me add one thing i'm okay with speedy trial if we did a lot through i think i what i want is consequence to people making decisions. I think lot through is a terrible idea. So the whole point of, of using miners to activate a soft fork is to make it safe. To make it so that if you don't upgrade your node, if you're running an old node, whatever, you're not going to get confused because the miners are making sure that sure. any any deviation gets gets reorged. But then let's make lot through. Yep. Yeah, as soon as you start adding game of chicken dynamics that can potentially lead to like giant reorgs, you have removed the whole safety. So so you're if you if you don't care about safety, then why are you don't. trying to do it safely? 
no, it's not black and white. Hang on. It's not black and white, right? There, there's like different shades of, of safety here, right? I think you could make a case that we've lost through NSPD trial, right? And a long activation period. You could make it safe. Well, the idea of speedy trial was was to try it before anything else. So something like Latru could have been done after the speedy trial. There is no point in doing a speedy trial with Lattice True because Lattice True is basically saying we're going to activate this software at some point in the future. Yeah. If, you, if you're going to do that, then I don't think you need the speedy trial. You can just use a Lattice True activation and then allow miners to signal from it right away. So there's there's no benefit in in the the speedy trial. I want people to like shit or get off the pot, right? I don't want to give people the benefit of just sort of like testing out little things because you know this is a way in which people find it's it's a way to test things that may not be beneficial to everybody, like without consequence. Well, that's why I'd, I don't like the speedy trial either because I I think it would have been fine to just do the regular BIP nine activation. Yeah, that's fine by me. And maybe we could have modified it to the BIP-8 without the Lattice Fall stuff because it uses heights. It's a little bit less, has a few less edge cases than uh, than BIP-9 does because it uses timestamps and you can do some annoying things with timestamps. Right. So I think we shouldn't have made a fuss about it. And it's very easy to deploy multiple soft forks at the same time using BIP-9. Now, if you start adding Lattice True, I really don't want to even think about what that will look like if you had multiple I don't think you can time. have multiple things going at the same time with Lattice. <laughs> you, you have some, you have uh, uncontroversial soft fork number one and another one number two, and then one of them causes a time bomb, but the other one activated. But then due to a giant reorg, the other one didn't activate. Or you, I don't want to think so about it. So here's an interesting thing. I, I still like have an unsettled, like my own personal preference. I don't know if I if I rather have many little things get activated unceremoniously, like often. And by often, I mean, you know, like say every six months and we even have like a, a set date, you know, that the little thing is going to work. And I mean little, I mean little, right? That something that does require activation and not bundle things into this Omni build sort of style. Because this is, I think a lot of people got a bad taste too during during the fork wars because like Segwit was kind of an ominous bill, right? So like you have the, all this crap in, right? It's very hard for people that don't understand like these things deeply to understand what's going on, right? And then people feel bitter about it after. So, but I don't know if it could have been done that much smaller. I mean, there were some, maybe some things you could have removed from it. This, if it's taproot, you definitely could have removed some things from it, but it was a nice package. Yep. No, I, I, I get it. You like, could have done like Schnorr separately and, and other things separately. I, I don't know. Is there conversations about like, you know, should we do the little things? Should we big make big bundles? Is there like a lot of conversation going on about like how to activate things? Is like a proactive thinking? All I can say is, um, you know, when I started doing Assume UTXO, and obviously like implementation changes are different from consensus, but I had this uh, very optimistic idea that I would carve this thing up into a bunch of tiny changes and do it bit by bit so that everybody could follow along and be assured that every, every step of it was safe. And in hindsight, I really regret that in some ways because I think it it winds up dragging things out to an incredible degree. It, it, it makes everybody fatigued. You have to test and retest and retest and retest. And, and like with a consensus change, I think to your point, you don't want to make the community kind of lazy and you don't want to just acclimate them to, you know, these constant changes rolling out because then they, they, they won't scrutinize them as much. Um, and so, you know, it's this tension between having these big you know, I mean, Segwit and Taproot, as I've said before, they're like these massive, uh, almost reinventions of uh, Bitcoin scripting. And, and they're great changes, but, um, but they, they are, you know, pretty hefty. So there's a tension between that and then having like a bunch of you know, small changes that get rolled out. And then people just get used to kind of upgrading consensus. And that's maybe a less than ideal state. You know, it's funny. I thought Schnorr, adding Schnorr, just Schnorr, not even talking about everything else, like it was going to be the thing. Like I thought that people were going to literally go to war over that. That's a fundamental change to Bitcoin. I mean, we now have a secondary crypto primitive in there. Like it's hard to convey. Like, I mean, you could almost say this is not Bitcoin anymore, right? Like, I mean, you know, it's just sort of like- I mean, the old notes isn't, it's anyone can spend. So, you know, it's, it's right. fine. No, but but it's, it's like, it's fascinating. The things you just never know, what is the thing that's going to tick the community and the, the thing that won't, right? Like, it's so hard to measure. Activation. I <laughs> thought it was hilarious. I, I thought that people got bent out of shape 
in terms of activation for Taproot was like the most ridiculous thing I'd ever seen because it's the least, to, to me, it's the least substantive part of the proposal. It's like, and so it almost, it, it felt to me like contrived. No, I mean, I was angry about the activation. I, I, I'm, I'm being very like open here. The activation was annoying me. I did not like the, the way it was kind of like, it felt shoved through the package I had no issues with. I mean, I always found it important for Bitcoin to have a second cryptographic primitive in case the other one breaks. So like we're ready to go well, kind not, of thing. Not that independent though. I, I would say that if ECDSA breaks, then Schnorr breaks. I mean, Schnorr, Schnorr is like ECDSA with a few lines of code removed, essentially. I understand. But like, you know, we have proofs for it. It's it's just nice to have, you know, maybe maybe the, the issue with CDSA is found that like, you know, it's in a minute part of it it's a subsection of it like you know it's just it only affects a certain kinds of keys that were generated whatever right like the, the point is it's nice to have a backup that's already part of the chain right but anyways going back to this the package was fine by me right like you know like i want these features i think they're great the issue was activation it did feel shoved through i think it was sort of like part of it was because of the ptsd a lot of people were not in the mood of talking and it's only gonna get weirder well, the shove through part is you could say the speedy trial kind of gave that feeling perhaps, but I think if there had been no drama, the BIP9 deployment would have been earlier than that we had speedy trial. So in a sense, I think it got delayed by all the drama by about, I don't know, three to six months. And then the, the speedy trial was kind of a way to cop out of the drama, the saying like, okay, let's just put this drama on pause, see if the speedy trial just works, and then we can continue the drama if it doesn't work. Well, it's a bit interesting that, you know, we had the, um, so uh, some folks from Optech and AJ Towns put together Taproot Review, and there was little groups that met each week or every two weeks and sort of went went through different uh, prompts and, and tried to review this, the code base, the package, as you say, Rodolfo. And I think... There was some good that, that came out of that, but in terms of the energy put in to that versus the energy that went into discussing about discussing about discussing the activation method, it's a little disheartening that so much energy and passion went into that where it felt like people were kind of going through the motions and actually reviewing the thing. So there's a bit of contrast there that I wanted to point out. I'm glad that people did do all that intensive review of the package. But yeah, I went to one of those workshops in London. It was really They were great. I mean, like it was it was incredible. That was really good. And I think part of the reasons why the, the activation will have more debate is because more people feel that they are competent in that. So because it's it's, it's in a way it's simpler, so it's easier to have an opinion. It's a bike shed. Yeah, it's exactly. I, I think you guys are, are sort of like looking at this more from from the the, the core perspective. I think there's a few things here. One is, yes, I mean, Taproot, Schnorr, and all the package, it's a little bit more complicated than your average industry person can sort of comprehend. The actual, like, technology there is not simple. But, but you know, like, there, there was two years of, like, people, like, seriously having, like, work groups and discussing and providing as much, like, listen, we're really trying to not create contention for when this thing comes about. Like, that was the sentiment, right? But I think the issue with activation is even people that don't want something get that thing, right? And 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 there is a certain feeling of of like getting a new consensus on Bitcoin being shoved onto your node, which is literally what happens. <laughs> and and I think it's a feature that these things are so horrible, right? Like they create a lot more uh, scrutiny on on the on the on the people on the on the package on the method, on the medium. And that, like, even though it will definitely make people retire early, it will definitely, like, make sure that, you know, some people need a long break. As horrible as it is, it's necessary. Like, it's something that, in my view, needs to be that way so that we discourage any kind of, uh, of like, a bad actor from trying to participate in that unless they're fully vested. But there's a difference between making it difficult to activate something and making it a drama to activate something. Oh, no, yeah. The, the, the drama, drama is if the drama is about the content of the thing, that's the kind of scrutiny you want. But if the drama is only about the activation method, then, well, that actually is all just review time that doesn't go to the package. So you couldn't have a malicious fork 
and then deliberately create a lot of drama around it, right? Around the activation of it, so that people don't pay attention to what you're actually doing. But you know, you could say that the activation method's still unsettled, right? So, like, there's going to be drama around that. I don't know. Maybe we should start working groups on figuring out new activation groups for the next uh, activation. I mean, my hot take on the activation is just bib eight minus a lot of true stuff, and it's fine. I think that's the thing is like if there was some fundamental objection to Taproot people had, they could have articulated it through speedy trial. Like yeah. it, it, the speedy trial could have failed. Um, and I, I just don't know that. I mean, I personally, I'm not interested in activation method. I, I hope to God if the op vault stuff goes well, like somebody else <laughs> has some strong, well-informed opinion about how activation happens because I surely don't probably somebody like, you know, with the intellect of shores, it should be thinking about that stuff. I, I don't have the mind for it, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I just think if they're either. that's why I <laughs> just do bib eight without the lot of true stuff because I've already reviewed that code, so that's right, fine. right, um, right. And, and you know, like guys, I, I don't, I don't think like there, there's no amount of discussing it at least at this stage of Bitcoin that I, I think will make it easier. Again, like you know, we came from an extremely contentious like game of chicken, which was Segwit, right, and then. It was fairly recent right after that we did another activation of something that was kind of like big and hard for people to understand, uh, even though all the information was available there for them to understand or or cope or whatever. But again, I, I think like the fact that people were not interested in entertaining the discussion about activation because everybody was just so PTSD from it, sort of like made people think that there is some more contention. It's sort of like this thing just fits on each on itself. But, you know, maybe the next one, because this one was fairly like, you know, for all the drama that it was, was fairly insignificant, right? I mean, compared to the previous. Mm -hmm. So I think the next one, depending on the Bitcoin price at the same time, because that matters, will sort of dictate maybe a slightly different dynamic. Maybe some galaxy brain comes up with something more clever that sort of like appeases most people or better compromise. Do we need something easy? Do do we need to to do the great consensus cleanup? I think that if we found a way to have miners have a back seat on it, and yet like they still have to participate because they still have to activate, right? Like, but if there was a way where the dynamic essentially deferred to the economic nodes in a way where even if it's like soft, I think it would go a long way because I think a lot of people. A lot of people are PTSD with miners trying to take control of the network. So I think having that, that dynamic somehow show that the, the economic nodes are kind of calling the calling the calling what's going to happen, really, it's kind of a big deal. Even if it's a pageant show and not the actual thing. But I don't know what you would demonstrate then. That that's always the the problem there. No, I know. I, I that's what I'm saying. I don't have an answer. Uh, so if you want to really have don't. a fun one, I guess the great consensus cleanup could be an interesting one to to get some some yeah, really exactly. complicated game theory. Because one of the things it does is it diffuses the um, the time warp bomb or the time warp right. thing. So then you could have miners that could vote to activate the cleanup, which would remove their ability to ever do a difficulty bomb or sorry, not a difficulty bomb, a time warp attack. But if they don't like it, then they could start, you know, immediately perform said time warp attack to frustrate the activation of this thing. And then I don't know what the game theory would look like, but definitely. Uh, I'm just saying, like, if anything, it would just be fun to watch. I'm going to buy a lot of popcorn. You know, like that, that would be an absolute fantastic event to happen in my lifetime. Yeah, but I think that the question you, you want to, I think one question that's important to ask is you know, is there some sort of future where you're worried about some specific change to Bitcoin that is very bad for the users, but somehow not bad for the miners and where you would have the miners push it through? Yep. Is that the thing you're worried about? Or yes, is mostly. there never a scenario where you're worried about the miners, but you're worried about the miners stopping the change from going through? No, I, 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 I'm not concerned about the miners stopping changes because... Aside from like, of course, not as true, right? If the miners don't stop it, you don't need uh, anything like that. Yeah, not technically, but in practice, you you kind of do. The main issue, I guess, is uh, I am afraid of miners activating things that users don't want. I'm not as concerned about them blocking because you know the only thing they would want to block is like you know say uh, algo change, 
right? But then they're already ignoring them anyways, right? Like yeah. anything that they would truly want to block are things that like you just be moving on from them anyways. So I, I don't think that that's a concern. I don't think we have a mechanism to stop miners from activating a soft fork that we don't Oh, yeah, know. no, I agree. Waiting for a very long time for some yeah. other group of miners to reorg them. So the most obvious bad soft fork that miners could deploy is a KYC soft fork, where basically like blocks are empty unless like miners have proved that you have done your KYC through whatever mechanism they want. Yeah, but then you add more fee and some other miners going to mine it, right? Like that's why like those kinds of like miner picks the transactions kind of like... Uh, attacks, right? Yeah. So, like, they do either empty blocks or whatever. Not very concerned. Well, that, that is a case where the just having miners enforce a soft fork doesn't really make it a soft fork because the economic nodes will completely ignore that rule set. Nobody will run a node that enforces that node, rule set. So, as soon as the majority of miners no longer enforces it, no longer reorgs out blocks that don't uh, comply with it, then you just get a Everything will just go in anyway. There'll, there'll be a, a giant mempool, maybe a few, uh, you know, 100 gigabyte mempool, but it'll, eventually it will go through. Now, another fun thing, too, on that game theory is that, like, you know, as Bitcoin halves, right, the rewards per block, like, you know, the miners further depend on the users, right, for their income. Mm -hmm. So, so like, it become it's going to become economically stupid for them not to mine the transactions, right? Like, even even if they don't agree with the transactions, even if their state is saying, hey, don't do this, because then they're going to just move their gear somewhere else, right? Yeah, but my doom scenario there is that they will get subsidized. So Sure, but, but then, you know, we're going to have an empty block every four. Who cares? Like, I mean, it's not the end of the world. It's going to suck. No, they'll get subsidized to reorg, basically. So basically, right. the minor revenue is not from coming from Bitcoin transactions. It's coming from governments that pay them to censor. This is the Eric Voskuel discussion. Yeah. Yes, very much so. Yeah, but I, I, I still don't think it would be as economically interesting as mining those. Because, see, what, what users would do is just further increase the fees, right? Like, and then you're going to have miners outside of that network to do it. And then you're going to start getting into Wakamole, where you're going to start, like, you know, blacklisting uh, miners. You're going to try to fork the, the, like, the actual stratum network. And, you know, like... It just gets weird nonsense. I'm sure they, they'll be very successful at bothering us for like a few months. But like, it's very hard to sustain this kind of stuff forever. Yeah, it'll be an interesting question about security budget. Like who has the bigger budget here? Is the economic use of Bitcoin, you know, are people really willing to pay enough fees to overcome an opponent that is willing to pay a lot of money to not have them make transactions? You know, a heuristic that I like on that, it's not like a perfect analogous to it, but it's like, Bitcoin is the largest computational capacity on Earth by like many, 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 many orders of magnitude. And it's still like this kitty pool, tiny economic system, right? Like, I mean, like Bitcoin is hilariously small. Even at the peak, it, like we barely hit a trillion and it's still like, man, what Apple probably has more cash than Bitcoin has its all value, right? Like, is it really though? I mean, I know we have a lot of hash power, but I think, I don't know how it compares to uh, other data centers. It's not like general purpose compute, right? It's, it's not general purpose, but, yeah. but it is. No, no, I, I get that. We're the biggest SHA-256 thing in the world, but we're not necessarily the biggest compute thing in the world. I think it is. Like some somebody did uh, some calculation on that, right? Like, and it was it was a crazy amount. I mean, ours is a specific. <laughs> Yeah, I have no idea how many how many gigawatts worth of data centers is out there that are just doing general compute and, and AI. Maybe Bitcoin is bigger than that, but maybe that not. came up. I think on the last, uh, on the, the, sorry, on the previous bull run. But anyways, somebody can uh, can give us some some notes later. So guys, like, there's like I guess like two things now. Like one th one main thing I want to address, and then like some questions from the audience. Unless you guys sort of like have things that you want to bring up, which is totally cool with me. So one thing is like really like the optimist view here, like what can we do to improve two things, the visibility on how the sausage is made so that the FUD can exist, right, as, as easy, right? So we don't have like Wall Street Journal writing retarded articles or at least retarded headlines. And the other thing is like how do we improve like development in terms of like, I wouldn't say like necessarily like attracting more people, but like getting the people that are interested in working on that, like working on that. Who wants to tackle like each question here? Well, to the first one, so the problem, I guess, is we have lots of good views into what's going on if you read Optech. 
but the average Wall Street Journal reader is not going to read Optech. So I guess then the countermeasure would have to be some popular science writer actually writing about random Bitcoin poor, core pull right. requests as if they're like super interesting. And that just takes a, a great science communicator or a great technology communicator that somehow can do it without coming across as a complete chill. Well, I mean, the, the cool thing about pop science is that you can just invent whatever the fuck you want and it goes into the thing as if it was true, right? I mean, you know, if you read any pop science magazine or whatever, I mean, half the stuff there is like like completely either a lie or wrong. <laughs> so, That's where the risk comes in, right? So whoever is that writer may then right. decide to start promoting Ripple all of a sudden right. uh, or, or at least promote some sort of hard fork that they want. So maybe it's good that Bitcoin is a bit boring. Yeah, I think, you know, the Wall Street Journal has political motivations. So you're never going to, you're never going to fix that. I think there's a there's a vested interest in misinterpreting the, the technological stuff. I actually spoke with the author of that article before the article, and it wasn't clear what he was going to be writing about. And the title is obviously very unfortunate, and it's also unfortunate that at least the discussions that I had with him, it didn't get through. And so I, I don't think it's a matter of making ourselves necessarily available to those people to educate them. I think that's okay. It obviously didn't work or it didn't work to the degree that I had hoped with respect to this article. Um, so maybe similar to how there's a developer, you know, legal defense fund, maybe there's another organization out there already or, or one that could be doing advocacy or or pr in in some of this regard at least at if we're talking about like the mainstream level i think if you're talking about a little bit lower level i think you guys had mentioned yeah that optech can, can help educate um at least from that very grassroots up but i i don't know I, I kind of lose i get dizzy when you get up at that mainstream level about what should be done you know uh one one little tip on media relations is when a reporter reaches out to you without being very clear on the article that he's writing. Like, oh, I'm writing this. Can you please help me understand so I can, you know, like I need a quote or whatever, right? If they're being wishy-washy about what they're writing, it's 100% a hit piece, either on you or on the topic you like. They're just using you as a means to get like better technical bullshit so that they can sort of fill in the, so it sound better. Well, the problem is that's hard to distinguish from actual good journalism because an actual good journalist writing an honest piece, which may or may not be critical, would also not tell you what they're going to write because that's their job. So now, now let's forward in the future. Let's say journalists do understand how the Bitcoin core development process works and we're, we're 10 years ahead and there's actually two or three malicious maintainers that are doing very sneaky things. I would like to have a mainstream journalist discover that and, and blow the whistle on it. But they're not going to be breaking that news. It's, you know, someone in the technical community is going to figure That's that right. out well before they would ever, you know. You, you know, I found like 99.99% of the time when they reach out with like, you know, they, they will be very specific when they're in good faith. Like, here is what I'm writing about. Or, oh, I read this awesome blog piece about like this feature that's coming. Can you please help me clarify it? Like they're very forthcoming of what they're writing when they're not being insidious, right? Like, and when they're like doing a hit piece or, or something negative, they always hide what they're trying to write. Yeah, there's a bit of observation bias in there because all the pieces True. that are mainstream pieces about Bitcoin have been negative hit pieces. So like it's 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 very hard that you would have been approached by an honest piece no no there, there has been i i've, I've had a piece especially in the past mm. quite some time ago where it was like mainstream just learning about bitcoin and stuff and you know the article didn't make it out but they were like earnestly trying to write like a decent piece about it to the extent that they can sort of comprehend especially back in the day well the, the first person we need to uh, you know as a, as a group of people need to convince how the process actually works is this you know a certain judge in england so that you know <laughs> that'll probably give us a lot of ways to phrase things that uh, that they understand. You know, again, see pol see political motivation. I I think yeah. um, I think we need to be ready to 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 reckon with the reality that these institutions are structurally motivated to find against Bitcoin in ways that are that are potentially unfair to the technical realities. Yeah, I'm not saying we should use those institutions to communicate these things. We should first figure out how to communicate them because that's quite hard. And that's why I said maybe the court case will give us some like 
actual ways to articulate it uh, that make sense uh, that are not just written by shills basically, but but have stood the test of scrutiny by somebody who's very adversarial on it. And then you need a medium to broadcast that stuff in. That could be you know somebody else going so, off. But, but to here's the, the thing, right? Mainstream functions in certificates and in uh, appeal to authority and all that stuff, right? And they have their own approved authorities, right? I, I think that the reality that Bitcoins have to sort of accept is that, you know, at least for the next decade, at least I believe, you know, we're just going to have an inhospitable sort of like space, inhospitable space for Bitcoin in mainstream, right? That'd be mainstream politics, that'd be mainstream anything really, because we're build, we're building the thing that sort of kind of like defunds them. <laughs> so like, you know, they're, they're not going to like it, right? There's going to be some defactors from them, but like the majority of them are just, listen, we're coming for your, for your brand. But if you're trying to reach large audiences, you don't need to go through traditional media. But anyway, yeah. like, I would call Joe Rogan mainstream media at this point. Right. Like mm-hmm. he's reaching a big enough audience. He doesn't get Bitcoin. <laughs> no, but you can go on his show and, and basically talk. So yeah. people have tried. Yeah, you guys are 100% right. I mean, we, we should be doing both, right? We should be we should be trying to communicate as best we can the realities and what makes Bitcoin special and the fact that it really isn't controlled by, you know, any single group of people. But I, you know, we also need to keep in mind that like uh, we have potentially a rough road ahead and, you know, we're, we're going to encounter a lot of headwinds in terms of, you know, institutions being kind of adversarial. There's a, yeah. there's some room for improvement even within our own house. I, I've noticed this. I, I'd be curious to to your guys' comments on this, but I've seen on Twitter lately a lot of uh, there shouldn't be developers in Bitcoin as a career or oh yeah, that moron Steve. Yeah, uh, well, there's that, but the, there's <laughs> him, and then there's others too. Like he may have, I don't know what his point. If I'm being, uh, if I'm steel manning his argument. Okay, so so Steve is a good friend, and I understand where he's coming from, and I I don't like it. I don't like Bitcoin ludism. It feels like ludism, right? Like it's like we were having this conversation. I think like a, an episode ago that I had the two of you there. Uh, I think it might have been the Op Vault episode, where we we're talking about gardening versus like you know like software does not exist without updates. And and I, def- I I differ in this mindset where it's like I believe that all the devs should be hired by actual industry, so it's very clear on their motives as opposed to like charities and things like the Brink is doing, like which is great, but it's harder to see what the intent is, right? Yeah. So his concern is that if if you employ people full time to work on Bitcoin, they are a constituency that develop their own interests. They can be, you know, subtly manipulated by the people who are paying them to work on Bitcoin. And and therefore, we shouldn't have anybody paid to work on Bitcoin. So there should be no Bitcoin developers, which is just fucking nuts. It's yeah, just no, insane. I know. But I think that's what happens when people who are not software people. Yeah. Right. right. Look at Bitcoin. Right. And in all honesty, I think most of the fault here is when you have a system that is very complex, opaque, and anarchic, right? Like, by nature. Like, it is fucking hard to understand Bitcoin. Like, yeah. I mean, you know, I was just joking before we started. Like, half the people complaining about Bitcoin on Twitter, like, don't understand how Bitcoin works, right? right? I mean, like, right. and these are people who go on spaces and talk about, like, Bitcoin as if they were some expert. I, I was just going to say real quick, and, and, and you know, I'm sure Shores and Mike, maybe this resonates with you to some extent, but I, I just wanted to make clear, the one thing I wanted to get, get across in this episode was, like, uh, assume UTXO op vault, like I wouldn't have done these things if someone wasn't paying me full time for the last four years to sit in a chair and like look at the Bitcoin source code. They would have been completely uh, uh, unreasonable to do like uh, in a part time capacity. And so I think that the funding well, is really important. It's self-flagellation to create Bitcoin proposals and, and like get them out. And it's try not to fun. Get yeah, no, no. Fun. I mean, it's it's very like it's not like the goodness of your heart that you do that. Like it's like it's really is like. Well, I mean, it is kind of the goodness of your heart too. But like, it's 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 like it takes a lot. <laughs> and it takes yeah. a lot out of you too. <laughs> yeah. You know, and and you know, people want to get paid to work. Like, I mean, that's it. It takes four years of full time context, at least for me. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but like, it, I, I, like it's it's a ton. It's a ton of time, and you just you're not going to make positive changes. You're not even going to be able to be capable of routine maintenance if you. I think if you those don't have comments the, are out of ignorance and frustration, right? So it's yeah. ignorance to like how software works, how it's maintained. Right. And then there is frustration with things like how things get activated, 
right? And 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 the consequences of where things are not really fought through, right? I mean, like, you know, nobody would have thought that people are going to use the discounted, unlimited witness of taproot to put in dick butts, <laughs> right? So the answer is, listen, stop fucking with my money, right? Please stop making changes. So, like, I understand that that's the sentiment that a lot of people get, right? right. And it's fair. I mean, yeah. they, they're not necessarily, like, wrong to say, you know what, stop right. it. I don't want more changes. I don't want more features. It's good enough for me, right? Emotionally, that's a completely fair stance, yeah. But the market might not agree with them. You, you need a, a 25.0 release of Bitcoin at some point. Otherwise, you're trying to run Bitcoin on a floppy disk, you know, from 1992. It's just, you, you, need, you need certain things to be done that are... Maybe not the the interesting proposal like OpVault that James is working on, which I think is also valuable. But I think these ossification folks don't realize that the ossification that maybe they're seeking, that maybe we could debate, ignore the that debate, but that they're seeking is at the protocol level. They're not seeking ossification at the software level per se, although the two are somewhat related. And I think there's a confusion. This is what I said earlier about we need to clean up and educate our, within our own Bitcoin Twitter house before we try to, you know, we got people who, who are our side, hard money Bitcoiners in the profile who say, there's, why is there anybody working on Bitcoin, right? So I think we, we got education to do. No, but for example, you know, it would be very easy to sell stuff like, for example, encrypted communication between nodes with uh, whitelisting, right? So they're like, you have like pub keys that you share with each other and now you're like actually preventing spam. So there's like a bunch of stuff you can do there, right? Like there is things that you can do because those things don't feel like you're messing with people's money, right? Even right. though you are creating slightly different dynamics in a way. So like, you know, there's a narrative, a, a narrative if issue. People think that, that software doesn't need problems. They should just try to run Bitcoin Core version 0 0.1. I, uh, I've never been able to. I think I've never been able to run anything before 0 0.5. Well, you need a Windows computer, right? Yeah, for one thing, you need a Windows computer, but try to run old Windows software. I think it will refuse to run it because it, I think it used to let you run in like 32-bit mode and it might not do that anymore. So operating systems get annoying. The other thing is compiling gets annoying. So if you are a business and you're running Bitcoin Core, probably you are compiling it yourself on your whatever infrastructure. Wait two years. Well, maybe on Linux, it's a little bit longer. I know on Mac OS, uh, every one or two years, Mac OS will do something to make compiling impossible because they've moved half the system libraries around. Uh, Linux is a little bit less annoying than that, but still, within five years or so, it's going to not compile. You need to figure out why it's not compiling. If you wait 10 years, it's just not going to work. It's going to be, and then you have zero days sitting probably in, in all sorts right. of places. So you can't run it without it getting attacked and shut down. And then maybe one day it'll be a consensus bug that we didn't realize and nobody knows how to fix it. But that's because people are not running FreeBSD because if they were running FreeBSD like us, they would have servers, they have like six years of time, you know, running an old core on it and everything is just fine. Don't touch it that's if it's working. That's why was using the same computers that they put in in 1970 <laughs> because they can't that's replace funny. the actual computer. If that's how you want to run Bitcoin, and sure, that sounds great. No, I, I'm just kidding. But but like, I, I think there is room for, for both. I, I think it's important that people run old versions. I think... I think we we need to communicate the importance of gardening, right? Because, you know, I was one of those people screaming ossify, right? But my ossification sort of idea, I feel like I was confusing people. So I stopped saying it because that included the gardening, right? Like what I mean, ossification is like, okay, let's be more conservative about new features, right? Because... You know, like maybe I want to, like, I want the inertia to start setting in. I don't know how much more should be done. Not that I have any control over anything, but like just in my own mind, right? Like of what is acceptable to me versus potential consequences. But I also think the protocol is not done yet in the sense that it's not going to be able to handle. And I think James talked about that on the uh, Marty Benta podcast, which was a nice uh, little therapy session kind of uh, <laughs> podcast. It was very good. Uh, the second half, like some people didn't like yes. the upvault stuff because it was too technical, but just stick through that. Uh, I mean, I find it interesting, but if you stick through it, it gets really existential. And one of the things is, yeah, we we need, if we want Bitcoin to work for the world population, and let's assume that it doesn't actually grow too much, it sticks you know, sticks to the order of 10 billion. Uh, yeah, we have some work to do. You know, uh, recently after the whole drama with ordinals, right? I think I was talking to Rindell and 
I sort of like kind of came to this realization just talking. They're like, okay, so it's 5,000 years have passed, right? Like there is not a single person that has been able to uh, verify from Genesis anymore. Yeah, I think that will happen eventually. Um, and No, but it gets extra interesting, right? You could have had some fork a thousand years in, they got swept under the rug and the people a thousand years after that sort of like forgot that history and sort of like moved on. You know, maybe there was a great fire in the cathedral, right? Like, and all the documents were burned. And, and this has happened through history, like a multitude of times, right? In in the cultures, they were the best at maintaining documentation in rocks, right? And there will so, be points that people will allege are like unfairly created. So there will be very yeah. rich families or, or ethnicities that will be accused, even just falsely accused of owning like false coins because some of the history is gone. And then that's the conspiracies right. will say, well, in that piece of history that we lost, that's where these people created these fake coins. And, and then there'll be horrible but, wars over it. So, but, yeah. You know, like having a form of conservatism, right, that is not ludism and, and having that as like this gardening mentality is the little bonsai, I try not to kill it, I just want to keep it going in a certain direction, uh, like, and, and conveying that, educating people on that and, and like literally explaining, if we don't change this, you cannot run core in the new processor. Right. Like if we don't do this, you can't do that in this other way of routing on the Internet. Right. Like. Things like that, I, I think, it will help people understand that like some <laughs> changes in software need to exist. Like, right. Or right. you're screwed. Or you might have the best version of Bitcoin, a floppy drive, and you cannot find a floppy drive. Right. Like that's what happens to software. God, I have some zip disks around. Well, well, people have an ideal picture of what Bitcoin should be. I think it's good to have an ideal picture of what Bitcoin should be, but it is important to realize that what Bitcoin should be is not what it actually is. Usually, this, you know, the reality is a little bit more complicated. Maybe just separating more of the consensus stuff from operational business logic stuff might help a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, and I'm not talking about the core, like the node versus the wallet part on Bitcoin Core, which is like god awful work and god bless if you're trying to do that and i'm talking about like and that's where it kind of goes back to the bip stuff you know like for example uh craig wanted a bip to do uh, labels right so wallets had like a standard for labels like you know and i'm not saying i have an answer either but like having sort of like this this other section of bitcoin core that's kind of like formal it's kind of like bitcoin core ish style but it's like for things that are unrelated to consensus, unrelated to deep code. I get what you mean. Just having a centralized index where you can kind of browse like, OK, well, here are some standards that maybe aren't. You know. Yeah. And, and maybe they get assigned a number to in a different thing. Like you have a, a separate spec there that's for like, you know, like I.O. stuff or whatever. Like maybe it's overcomplicating. I don't know. But like industry wants something set in stone to develop on top, right? Like ideally, right? So it's like, you're not like, for example, we we did the PSBT thing, was forgotten, nobody was using it. But then like, as soon as we started doing PSBT because nobody was going to do it, oh no, we want to kind of change it and fix it a little bit, right? So it's like, ah, you know, of course this was going to happen, right? Like everybody forgot about it, nobody wants it, but then somebody starts using it, well, let's change it, right? So it's just this idea of having a better place for standards that are more business logic standards to exist that maybe separate the drama of that from the consensus drama, which is very different. But so far, it's it's just one giant blob of code and it is being organized better. But I think no matter how you do it, you also want to clean up the code in that giant blob or even in the consensus part of well, however you want to define that, even if we have a separate kernel, you know, that's being worked on, that kernel itself will have C++ code that will want to make maybe safer so it doesn't crash or so that mm -hmm. it still compiles or so that it validates signatures three times faster. Things like libsec p, uh, uh, sorry, libsec p 256k9, uh, k1. Uh, that's a library and it's being maintained and it is extremely important and it actually gets- Can you imagine if that was done inside core? I think it was brilliant that they did it. Yeah, no, it's, it's done outside core, uh, yeah. but it is, you know, being updated to core and that's a library that I don't know how to review it. It's super scary. No, I don't think there is uh, more than 10 people in the world that can. I feel good yeah. when I see the test suite didn't change. Um, <laughs> then the, if, <laughs> right. the, if, if the right test factors are there, it's probably not malicious. But uh, good luck reviewing that. 
No, but, but like, that's the thing, right? Like, it goes back to this heuristic of having, like, great beards you trust. I mean, like, you're not going to get out of that. Well, that's true not, for not airplanes. Just the, not just the great beards. I mean, you can also, you you will use the new version. You will sync the Bitcoin Core blockchain from scratch with the Zoom Valid off and mm-hmm. a bunch of things like that. So, so you know, at least that whatever shenanigans they did, they didn't, like, you know, if I, if I run that thing and a new blockchain appears, then I'm like, yeah, this is odd. But that, that usually doesn't happen. Hey guys, uh, we're hitting two hours here. I, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, do you guys want to go through some questions here from from the audience, or 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 are you guys sort of like okay, like I think we've addressed most of it and sort of cap it at that? Yeah, let's do questions if you think there are good ones. There might be. I, I haven't read them yet, so uh, heads up there. Who Nostra only? So okay, so can a more public facing website be built to show active developments and what stage they are in? Navigating GitHub can be imposing for the average person from and rue. It's ne- it's it's problematic for Bitcoin developers too. Like you, you can be working in your own little corner and you have no idea what's happening in other. I think it's two people. things. I mean, the average person is not going to understand what's going on, anyways. So I, I think that the proverbial average person is completely hopeless and is going to have to trust companies and people. Well, Optech, like you said, does a really good Optech. job of surveying everything That's right. and i, I just also think the mailing list for you yeah yeah it's very nice it's right. just it's it's just a lot of work it's a ton of work to aggregate that stuff you would really have to go out and like basically interview all the frequent contributors and i it'd and be you a, don't know what's gonna stick or get abandoned for a while either it's like yeah. you don't want to invest too much effort into stuff that could just sort of sit there forever yeah i mean peers bitcoin axe thing was pretty cool yeah what was uh, that? And you could put bounties, right, on, on PRs. It didn't too. really work, though. Like yeah. the bounties never really worked. I think you could kind of, but. There's a couple of different layers. Obviously, if you know enough, uh, you can look at the code um, or issues. And then at a level higher, some of the PRs are tied into projects on GitHub, which may help summarize some of that. But I think a lot of that gets out of date and maybe that's still mm-hmm. too technical. Then you have Optech, um, which does weekly, but it's still pretty granular. I've tossed around the idea, maybe even James back when you were at Optech of like Optech being like the, what, what happened, what, you know, what got changed, what got discussed, what, you know, what's on the mailing list and there being the ability to maybe have a so what on top of that, that digest that. We did one of those with Optech and, and having um, an executive briefing and sort of summarize that for executives. Maybe there's a way, for example, to take the Optech end of year digest mammoth write up and doing a so what on top of that. And maybe that would make it more accessible for people. Um, I don't know if that's what that question is asking, but maybe that's a potential solution. I normally don't have time to go through the whole uptack. Like it's it's, it's like because it's just there's too much stuff going on in Bitcoin, and How you guys are ready to curate. <laughs> no, and you guys are ready to curate all that stuff into even last, right? You condense that and you give a lot of TLDRs, which is fantastic, but it's just too much, right? So one thing that I really love is, is that spaces that you guys do, which I wish was longer. Great. I really longer. wish it was longer. You want it longer? Yes. I mean, dude, like, there's no topic in Bitcoin that you can do in less than two hours. This was something that one of the reasons why I started the spot is because you cannot have any Bitcoin conversation in less than two hours. Like if it's less than two hours, it's because it's just interviewing a person that's like sort of like explaining exactly what the, the narrative they had in their mind. Right. Like, which we all do. But like, it's it's impossible. Like these topics just have too many tangents. They're complicated, you know. So, yeah, longer. Uh, or or like more of them in topic specifics. One good thing is like, for example, in the interview style, like deliver episodes on pretty much everything that happens, right? He'll find a person that either created the problem, resolved the problem, or proposing something and have the person talk for an hour there, right? That's very helpful too. I know another podcast. Sorry? I know another podcast. Yeah. The Shores NATO. Yes. Yeah. Something. But you, something. you know, like... But your your pod is like is very good for like average people to try to understand Bitcoin, but it's not like addressing like specific like issues that are timely, or is it? Like- yeah, it's it's mostly actually we try to be evergreen. So there's lots of episodes, and some people will even approach me saying, "Oh, I just listened to your entire backlog," which is like that's impressive. That's what people do, by the way. Yeah, and the, the thing is, most of these things, most of these episodes are still 
correct. As in some of the proposals may have changed the pace. Yes. But it Absolutely. is not a current events episode. It's just yeah. that we often run out of topics and then we'll do like, oh, what's new in Bitcoin Core for Vision 24? And that's our, our version of clickbait. But we'll still explain what's, what's in there. But I am a listener. Thank you. Right. Okay. All right. So, so let's move on to the next question here. Current FUD from MSM about small number of devs. Uh, we've already addressed that one. That was from 1F52B. Well, we didn't address the part that they uh, confused developers and maintainers, right? They, they really just suggested there was like six developers, even though there are more than 100. Yeah, but I, I don't think we can address that. That's just stupid. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's easy, either, either like malicious stupid or just like, you know, like Sloppy. blissfully ignorant or whatever. It's just, you know, that's just read more. I heard a little, a little thread on Mastodon basically pointing out some of the... Uh, Errors in the article, right. including, I think, that one. Anyway, yeah, we've addressed it. Yeah. Uh, okay, Ben Gunn. Please debunk the FUD about centralization of contributors. The same one. Like, So this is what's doing the rounds. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be centralized because, you know, there's only so many brains in the world. So the easier the problem, the more people will be there to help address it. And, uh, you know, you're going to have to trust people to a certain extent. But... We have great webs of trust so that you can check the signatures and check the code and check the releases. And We also have this, this thing called sort of the whistleblowing effect, right? That's so, right? So even if the person who you trust to keep an eye on things might, you know, be asleep, as long as you have some access to what happens in the rest of the world by being on some social network or talking to some people occasionally, you'll find out that there's something really bad going on. That's also a mechanism that you're trusting, I think. Yep. Christopher Liss, uh, I still don't entirely get derivation path and why it can be the same. Okay, this is out of scope for this episode. Highly, highly recommend going check out uh, walletsrecovery.org. I put all that information there. Bitburn, I would cover some aspects of the blockchain wars and the history of development. Yeah, I think we've sort of went around it. And there's a book about the blockchain wars, right? Called the blockchain wars. The block size wars. Jonathan Beer. Johnny. Yeah. BTC Totoro. I'd love to hear a bit about what, uh, what like a day or a week in trenches working on Bitcoin Core is like day in, day out. Does the job feel isolating and alone or is it the opposite where it's lots of people willing to help and find issues? Well, the two of you, they're called on it, so go for it. It's basically like any job where you're working from home, except you don't have direct colleagues in the same way. You don't have a boss that's screaming at you. And so you have no idea what you should be working on. No, it's, it's not, I don't know. It's not always easy. No, I find it exceptionally difficult at points, especially if you're kind of in the middle of working on something that's not, you know, getting a lot of review or you're unsure about how to proceed on something or, you know, you're, you're kind of, you spend a lot of time trying to figure out what's worth working on. And the other thing is you spend a lot of time doing code review because code review is one of the most you know valuable things in Bitcoin. Um, Shores is really, really good at doing review and testing. But that's, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, I mean, personally, I, I find a lot of joy in being in an office environment and seeing people and talking to people and, you know, seeing people face to face. And you get zero of that because, you know, you get it a few times a year when, when the core devs, you know, some of them meet. But it's, it, it can, I can, it, 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 for me, it's very isolating and very difficult. Well, one thing that's peculiar about, I guess, Bitcoin Core as a team or to the degree that it's a team, there's no office. There's no central mm -hmm. office. There's not even a central mm -hmm. spot. It's not like, oh, if only you move to City X, then you can be somewhat more in people's company. Like, you, mm -hmm. you know, there are some cities where you have more it's than two. It's also very academic, too. It's mm -hmm. very academic, yeah. It's, it's, you know, like you have to have a like a threshold of of like pain that's very high. At least in my view, I don't exist in academic environments. <laughs> like you have to be yeah. prepared for that sort of like you know slow pace and sort of like very sort of like uh, review like and and you know it's it's uh, it's the opposite of business, really. I tell people it's like doing a PhD, except you don't have an advisor. Like <laughs> you you're just on your own, you know, hoping you're doing something useful. Well, worse than that, I think, there, because there's no scope. So you can, there's not, like, it's not ever finished. It's not, you're not producing a single document. Although, you know, some people like yourself are working on very specific, fairly large projects that at least gives you some focus. 
I mean, one of my things is that I review very random stuff. So, there's, yeah, there's almost no scope there. Mm-hmm. Uh, that can be tricky. And the other thing that is that is just generally more fun, I guess, and or not like a serious problem, but the way GitHub works is it uses notifications. And I have been advocating for killing that blue dot because it just draws my attention. And what it does is it makes you focus on pull requests that get a activity on them. Mm-hmm. What it means is that you'll focus on things that are very active and it's very easy to start forgetting about stuff that is not active. So it actually amplifies. A pull request that becomes stale become even more stale because nobody's getting notifications for them and nobody looks at them. But well, there's perverse incentives there. Yeah, and then, and then you get to a point where it's like apps, right? Like people creating new releases just so people look at it, right? People are going to keep on updating the code even though there's nothing that should be updated. They, they will update just the docs or something. So it goes up to I'm the I'm doing top. that so that, that I get on your podcast. <laughs> but there are some countermeasures. Like I have my own to-do list system that will actually show me what things I wanted to review. But sometimes I... I don't get to that and I review recent stuff more often. I have like five of those to-do list systems and I keep making them and abandoning them. Like I have, you know, uh, like five different lists with PR numbers on them to review. You know, I do not do to-do lists. Fuck to-do lists. Fuck calendars. No. You sit and you do. No calendars. That's, no. wow, that's barbaric. I don't know. You know, like, listen, you know, like I have some bare calendars, like, for example, Johnny would put the, the episodes to do, or, you know, I have a call with a lawyer, but I don't schedule a single anything unless it's like, you know, trying to get a group of people to do a mm, like, very yeah. specific, yeah. Uh, uh, for anything more than two days. I don't schedule anything more ahead than two days. I, I want my calendars clear, completely clear, so that if I want to do something, I can do the thing. Wow. wow. Yeah, the same here, I think. I mean, I use calendars only for things that physically have to happen at a certain time in a certain place. I do not use them to say, oh, I'm going to work on X, I'm going to work on Y. GTD. It's it's very GTD, and I'm not saying GTD is perfect. GTD has some huge drawbacks, but I've been using that since uh, 2005, I think. Uh, And as a general system, I like it. And the tool I use for it is OmniFocus, which is a a simple Mac app. I remember that one. And it really does the job. The thing is... GTD, you can have a to-do open for months and it'll you won't forget it. So the nice thing about GTD is you will never forget to do something. However, you may still never do it because it's just you're just not doing it. Yeah, no, I can't I can't <laughs> do it that. It's like, you know, if I have things that need to be done, they're gonna get done. If they don't need to get done, they're getting off the list. There's no middle ground. I'll toss everything in the system that needs to be done, but sometimes, I'll, but usually when I'm doing things, I'm just doing them based on notifications or what I feel like. But then I know that I have this trusted fallback system that I can go through every item and make sure that, you know, the things I did impulsively, I can just check off and the things that I didn't do, then, oh, yeah, I need to do those. So it's a, it's a nice system, but, um, yeah. You know, unimportant items, just, it's like, it's like noise pollution in things to do. They just like deviate you from like the things that are actually important shit gets done. Yeah. But not when you're reviewing, like, you, you know, like it just, it, because it needs to happen like taxes or like, you know, shipping, whatever. Like if you're like pushing from, push, so from like pushing, say new firmware or something, like it's probably because those features are not that important. No, but I, I, if, if you look at like, you know, in GTD, you have things, something called a project, which is anything that's more than one action. And a lot of my uh, reviewing things are basically saying, wait for this thing to get rebased or updated. Right. That's, that's just a waiting for thing that's there. So occasionally it, that'll pop up and I'll look like, hey, has this actually somebody touched this? And then the next instruction would be to, for me to, to test it. Or uh, and for my own pull request, usually the project just consists of wait for feedback or it being merged, but th- that's a one action project. So it's still nice to have a list of things that I care about. The Eisenhower matrix, right? The urgent and important, right? And you don't necessarily want to be spending your time in the urgent important quadrant of that. You probably want to be spending your time in the not urgent but important category right. so that you don't have to worry about that. Yeah, right? just get mm. shit out of the way. Like it's it's uh Well GTD makes no such quadrant, right? It's just things that can be done given the context, given that you yeah. are behind your computer, what what could be the next action? 
Maybe we should do uh, an episode on just uh, time management. <laughs> well, it, I'd it, like it, that. This works better. I mean, I, if you ever want to read the book, you should read the original one. So the one from the 1990s, which uses very analog technologies to, to get the job done. He wrote a new one, but it's too abstract and too long. So yeah, stick to the old one. Mm-hmm. And the, the thing it doesn't really, has, doesn't really account for is this world of instant notifications that we're getting now, which GitHub is one of the problems, but Mail is another. I mean, part of that is just you want to kill all those notifications. You, you, should not get, you should not be getting push messages from Twitter. That's just like, if that's what you're doing, that's not good. But yeah. I, I think like people just struggle with like actually triaging what is actually important. And and then like and then sort of like the the complacency kind of sets in because you know it's just we're all human right like it really is just that's the true challenge it's like what's really important and, and then like people don't leave room to just like fucking do nothing too and like just reflect mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Just that's very important be stupid and yeah. and that's where the best ideas come from be too bored. it's like you know people are like oh you know like I can only do coffee for fifteen minutes I'm like what kind of life do you live like I I could sit here with you for the afternoon and I have a company to run like you must be really 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 important. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, you don't have to be busy all the time, all the day, basically. It's That's horrible. Anyways, all right. So uh, a, a couple more questions here, and, and, and we're, we're setting this one off to bed. Aside from C++, are there any prerequisite, prerequisite skill knowledge a dev should have before attempting to contribute? Gary Krause. Python is nice. That's great. Some people have actually, that was their entry point. They knew Python, and they would be helping writing better tests. Mm-hmm. C is nice if you want to work on libsec p. C is not nice, but it's useful for that. No, but C is it's like if you can do C, it's the world is, is your oyster. It's like it, it's it's a different thing, right? You understand computers now. I think the philosophy is important too. I think there's a, a couple of different documents that would help, even if you do know sort of the technicals. If if you're talking about doing Bitcoin core work, there's a Bitcoin development philosophy doc that's on. GitHub that you may be interested in from a phil- philosophical perspective. And then um, Will Clark is working on an onboarding to Bitcoin core uh, document as well that I think if you combine that with the technical knowledge would be very valuable for a budding C++ Bitcoin developer wannabe. Yeah, and if you want to do testing, you don't actually have to understand either of these languages, at least not in detail. Uh, what is much more useful for testing is understanding how Bitcoin Core should behave. A lot of w- what I do with review is just like I'll see somebody change something and I know how it should behave and I'm going to try and guess what they forgot and then see if I can break it very quickly and then just say, okay, you broke this part and then move on to the next podcast. So just knowing how a piece of software should behave, uh, a kind of QA work that is useful too. So it does require that you've probably used the software a lot before you know, because otherwise you're going to file bugs about bad behavior in Bitcoin Core, and I can guarantee you those bugs have been filed hundreds of times and nobody wants to fix them. So it is important to know, you know what the things is that are bad that we care about. This reinforces this idea that like, you know, and why you need to have full-time people on it is because it, it takes like, you know, like nearly a decade for somebody to have full visibility on the code base. Right, like, like a good sort of like broad view on what's going on, right? You will like, never have full visibility on the code. Yeah, base. but you have full visibility on like ten percent of the code base. Sure, yeah. but but the point is that like you know it takes years for you to sort of like get what's going on, right? Like in a system that's that complex, and, and that's why you want to have people that make their money like doing that all day, right? Like if you're just like a tourist. To Bitcoin Core, you're not going to understand why something was done in a stupid way <laughs> or why it was inherited that way and is not going to change. I don't think you need to do it full time, by the way, but I'm very Dutch right. in that sense. I think you can do things part time, but over the long, but it's nice to have long term continuity, though. Yep. Uh, there was, okay, so here's another question that's uh, along those lines too uh, open source optimist guy. How are decisions made about code based structure and best practices? So like just I, I'm just interpreting his question here, but like code structure and sort of like best practices and sort of like how how the core sort of like prefers things to be done and there's a developer notes uh, markdown file in the GitHub repository that has a bunch of these standard things like you know do the indentation this way, do the indentation that way. There's a few linters that check things, 
And other than that, I think the convention is to do whatever similar code was already doing, like kind of just follow the existing pattern. Uh, don't come in and factor all the commas in the code. That's, you're not going to make people happy. The document that Mike referenced earlier, the uh, onboarding to Bitcoin Core, I think spends a lot of time talking about architecture and the considerations that would involve and kind of the evolution of how things have gone. So that's that's really, I mean, that's you could do a two-hour podcast on just that, how Core should be architected, how it is architected. So um, that document's definitely worth reading if, if you're curious about that. Yeah, but usually, usually if you're making a small change, you know, you're not changing the structure that much. So if you're new to the project, you, you probably don't need to know all that because you're just going to make an, a small change. Though, if you want to understand, you know, if you're making any more complicated change, you'll have to understand at least how the code works. Okay, so Bourbonic Plague would love to hear discussion around contributing anonymously to risk personal attack and all that stuff. So uh, the other day, I made uh, I made a post about how like uh, I, I think maybe like people should share IDs. Do like uh, uh, ID mixing, you know, like uh, ID shuffling, and you know, I I highly like recommend people doing uh, creating NIMS uh, for their for their submissions. The code is gonna get reviewed anyways. It's not because you have a bigger name that your code is not gonna like it's gonna go faster or whatever. But do you remember the thing that we just talked about about like the work being quite hard and you very occasionally meeting other people? Now you're removing that part too because you're not. Yeah, but you know, safety, right? Like nothing is without trade-offs. Maybe, maybe you have some great ideas, or you want to fix some work, and you don't want to expose yourself to like mm -hmm. any dynamic that may come from working on Bitcoin, positive or negative. Uh, you know, come in as an M, do something, and leave. Shaolin yeah, Zeman, Zeman's doing it, right? He's yeah. got funding. He he's got funding, as far as I know, on uh, and that's uh, anonymous. He uh, communicates with voice, and he's been on the Optech recap that we've done. So he's still connected, and maybe maybe he wouldn't do an in person uh, meeting. But yeah. you know, like guys, it's also not that. Like I think, like the the fear is blown a little bit out of proportion because you know a few devs had issues with Craig Wright and stuff. I mean, realistically speaking, like you know, there's a lot of people working in, and like. The great, great, great majority never had any issues that I know of. So, you know, like, don't just fall for the the fear too. Like, you know, have some balls and, and go get some shit done. Kind of depends on where you live too, right? If you, if you live in a uh, sort of, you know, free speech-ish place, uh, it's going to be a little bit different than if you live mm -hmm. in a country where like being even remotely involved with Bitcoin is like death penalty stuff. So, <laughs> right. I, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think we can leave it on that note. Listen, guys. This was a, a huge pleasure. I, I really appreciate like you guys putting all this time. I, I hope we manage to to have people sort of like have a, a, another inch of understanding on how Bitcoin works and the dynamics in that. I think many people who listen to this to the show probably know how to contact the guests and sign up for uh, Mike's mailing list. You know, subscribe to Schnorr's, uh, uh podcast. You know, uh, follow James in multiple places. Yeah. So any final thoughts, uh, James? Thanks for throwing a great podcast. I always love coming on and uh, talking to you. Hey, man, I, I really appreciate it. It's, uh, you guys are, are, are awesome. Uh, Shores. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, please check out Bitcoin Explained. And uh, buy his book. Uh, Mike. Yeah, I think it's easy to listen to two and a half hours of people talk about how strange everything is and bips here and that and activation and fighting and mailing list and, and to be discouraged by that. But I think that the alternative is much worse, which is organization and control centralized in a single place. And Bitcoin represents the opposite of that. So I think we should embrace the decentralization and some of the chaos and, and craziness that we've talked about on this call as, as a positive thing. So uh, just maybe try to end on a high note. It's a really good point. Oh, for sure. I mean, it, it's working. <laughs> you know, Bitcoin is working. People are working on it. Businesses are being built on it. And, uh, you know, like it's hard, but, but it's clearly going somewhere. Uh, and with that, I, uh, you know, closing up. Thank you so much, guys. 
Thanks for listening. If you're new to the pod, make sure to listen to some very cool other episodes. Episode 15 about lightning, episode 11 about podcasting 2.0 and value for value. And we also had a hardware wallet security panel on episode five. Don't forget to follow at Bitcoin Review HQ or get in touch on Telegram, Bitcoin Review Pod or Bitcoin Review at CoinKite.com. We don't have a crystal ball, so let us know about your projects. Leave your boostagram on this episode and we'll try to read it on the next episode. We've added more people to the splits. Now, if you send us streaming sets, some of that go to opensets.org and also to Citadel Dispatch with my guest, Odell. If you don't know much about Value for Value or Bitcoin Podcast 2.0, go to bitcoin.review slash v4v. Mm-hmm.